to the Alex Jones Show on this Wednesday, November 16th, 2016. I'm David Knight, and joining me is Owen Schroer. We're going to be talking the first hour. Uh, in the third hour, we're going to have Leanne McAdoo. Uh, she's going to be joining us to talk about the news. Today, uh, America is getting great again. By every metric, we're seeing amazing stuff, aren't we, Owen? We got the dollar hitting a 14-year high. Wait, they we... told me the economy was going to collapse when <laughs> yeah. Trump got in. Yeah, well, you know, they had some jittery uh, stock market stuff, but they always use that in order to take profits. But now we got the stock market soaring. We got the uh, dollar to 14-year high. We have uh, had an announcement of one of the biggest oil discoveries ever in Texas. And we're going to talk about that in the second hour. We're going to talk about the myth of peak oil that has been sold to us for as long as they've had oil, <laughs> basically. But in the last few decades, it's been a product of the CIA. That's what has been behind our foreign policy. It's what's been behind our petrodollar. It's been intricately linked in our uh, Federal Reserve System, as well as our geopolitics. And this is really going to shake things up. One of the things that the left is really upset about is the uh, announcement that, by Trump. Of course, uh, he's, he's made it uh, very clear that he believes global warming is a hoax, and it is a hoax. And we're going to tell you how that works out. <laughs> we're going to tell you why it is. We're going to show you the lies that the media has been telling you since the 1980s. As a matter of fact, I've got a news uh, week magazine right here from the night from 1979. And you can see you could get it for a dollar twenty-five back then. Uh, the energy crisis, and they pronounce in there how in 1979 they predicted we were going to be totally out of oil in eight years. Well, here we are, 37 years later. We just had the biggest discovery of oil in the United States that we've ever seen. Uh, OPEC is on its knees, and the reporters are outraged that peace is breaking out, prosperity is. And Donald Trump hasn't even taken office, and we see all these things happening. So you got an easing of tensions with the Russians. Uh, the stepping back from the brink of nuclear disaster, stepping back from the Cold War number two. And Alex Jones, we're going to have a special report from him in the next uh, segment. He's talking about how the world has pulled back from the brink. Uh, the media is outraged. Soros is outraged. He's trying to create a color revolution here in the United States. And the media is so upset about the fact that Donald Trump went to a restaurant in New York without taking them along. <laughs> and and it, they make a big deal like there's some sort of a threat to his security, which we would agree. I mean, we've been saying, you know, pray for Donald Trump. We want to make sure he gets to the inauguration safely. But but what is the left media talking about? What threat? Are you talking about the violent protesters that you said were peaceful? Why would why would anybody want to kill Donald Trump? I don't understand. He couldn't get in. What is there some secret society out there that murders people that threaten their power structure? Well, how is about the on? Hollywood executives and the uh, the CEO of a security company that made threats on social media? We've seen people arrested who made threats against Donald Trump on social media, but they're not. Uh, <laughs> CEOs, they're not Hollywood executives, and when they come out and call for the financing of violent revolution, as that filmmaker did, what's happening to that, okay? You've got him calling for that, you've got George Soros doing that. We're going to talk about how George Soros has a, uh, a, a conference that is uh, coming up in Washington, and he's going to uh, challenge his uh, people to do something to oppose Trump. The war is already on between the media and George Soros. We have to understand that's what's happening. So with all this other good news that you might think is good news, the fact that uh, OPEC's power has been crushed, that the dollar is soaring, the stock market is soaring, that we've had an easing of strained relations. I mean, everybody was very ex excited when uh, Nixon announced detente, an easing of strained relations. And yet uh, now the media is just apoplectic about the private dinner with his family. Well, and you've got the magazine here from, what did you say, it was the 70s or yeah. 80s? So, 79, yeah. And you can illustrate how what they do is like, oh, the people in charge of the oil industry are trying to sell you on a shortage of oil. I wonder why they would do that. They don't care about the planet. That's why they've been fracking. That's why they've been doing this to begin with. But that's neither here nor there. It's a sales push, David. And you can come on here. You can illustrate that. You can try to then link that to what they're doing with global warming and carbon taxes. But will the people listen? And we'll be talking about that when we come back. But right after the break, Alex Jones. Trump pulls the world back from the brink of nuclear war. But Soros is starting his own war here in the United States. We'll be right back. Zach, this is Crystal Palace. St. Norad has declared DEFCON 3. Scramble all alert aircraft. I repeat, scramble all alert aircraft. George Soros was dealt a massive defeat with the landslide populist uprising election of Donald J. Trump one week ago. 
Soros has openly bragged on CNN's Fareed Zakaria's program that he helped finance and run the overthrow of the democratically elected government in Ukraine two and a half years ago. You, during the revolutions of 1989, funded a lot of dissident activities, civil society groups in Eastern Europe, in Poland, the Czech Republic. Are you doing similar things in Ukraine? Well, I set up a foundation in Ukraine before Ukraine became independent of uh, Russia. Um, and the foundation has been uh, functioning ever since. And it played a, an important part in events now. And Soros has now met, according to Politico, this weekend in D.C. with dozens and dozens of top billionaires and other financiers to organize a new revolution in America, a black slash rainbow color revolution, uh, basically based on gang mentality and racism and pushing the lies that Donald Trump's a homophobe and hates black people. You are a racist. Yes. Oh, That's right. sad. Oh, That's real sad. He's against you. Why will you why will you support a racist? He's gonna send you back to Africa. That's what he said. He said send Mexicans back to Mexico. You you are you shit you are a disgrace to America. For being a young black man supporting a racist. Thank you. When all he's done is pledge to cut taxes on poor people across the board to zero and have incentives to build factories and other uh, job bearing programs and industries in the black community and has been an advocate for gay rights for 30 years. But that doesn't matter. George Soros, the bizarre Nazi collaborator that's still walking around has pledged to start war with Russia, has pledged to turn the Middle East over to radical jihadist groups working with Saudi Arabia. He's overthrown more than 15 countries and destroyed their currencies. He is a true James Bond villain, and he is hopping mad that the defense condition had been brought all the way to three, which is the nuclear bombers ready, the missiles ready, from five, and has now gone back to five because Russia and the United States are now entering a level of detente. And just yesterday, Vladimir Putin called Trump, and Trump said we're going to have a new relationship with Russia. We're going to try to base it on peace, and we're going to have mutual respect and try to work towards wiping out radical Islamic invasions across Russia's border and also the Middle East. Across the board, real political analysts, a lot of top professors and real liberals came out and said, this is a great idea. This is what the world needs. The Democrats and Soros are in an open war against free speech. That's what political correctness is all about. They have CEOs calling for the death of Trump, the actual assassination, saying they're going to kill him themselves. They need to be arrested. We have directors saying it's time for violence. Katy Perry. This is the whole corporate Hollywood mouthpiece of the big multinational corporations that have hijacked this nation. And we've got the New York Times thinking you're so stupid. They now just don't deny world government which is admitted, or global governance. They now say globalism never existed and that the Davos group isn't pushing for it when they admit that's their term and their plan for corporate planetary government. We are now facing a common challenge. And the challenge is how to build a world order for the first time in history on a global basis. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, a new world is emerging. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new challenges. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Good evening, everybody. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the U.S. would participate fully. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. So I see a uh, world order in the future with a multipolar uh, world order. I think the new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. But in a globalized economy, 
We are going to have to take global responsibilities, and there going to, is going to have to be some several semblance of global governance. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions, or on so global a scale. Nor has any previous order had to combine the attributes of the historic balance of power system with global democratic opinion and the exploding technology of the contemporary period. And I surely believe India will be a central actor in the new world order. Soros allies like Megyn Kelly have come out and called it the year of the bully concerning Donald Trump when he has never killed anyone like Hillary Clinton has done. Hillary Clinton and her actions killed over 500,000 Iraqi children with their sanctions that were worse than Bush seniors. They killed tens of thousands upon tens of thousands in Libya and hundreds of thousands in Syria. All of that was her doing and Obama's doing. But their poor, sad, dumbed-down constituents don't care because they've learned words like homophobe, racist, and sexist. The good news is the same majority of white voters that elected Obama to prove that they weren't racist elected Donald Trump to prove that they weren't stupid. And they were joined by the largest group of black voters for a Republican since the 1950s and the largest group of Hispanics as well, which shows no matter what the mainstream media do and how much hate they spew and no matter how much money criminals like George Soros pump into this, the people of America and the world are waking up to globalism. Russia's pulling out of the corporate new world order. The UK's pulling out via the Brexit, and we're pulling out as well. It's about sovereignty, it's about self-determination, and it's about standing up to international crime bosses like George Soros. You went out with this protector of yours who swore that you were uh, his adopted godson. Yes, yes. Went out, in fact, and helped in the confiscation of property from the Jews. That's right. Yes. I mean, that's, that sounds uh, like an experience that would send lots of people to the psychiatric couch for many, many years. Was it difficult? Uh, uh, not, not, not at all. Not at all. It, uh, maybe as a child, you don't you don't see the connection, uh, uh, but it was it created no no problem at all. All right, that was Alex Jones, a special report. I'm David Knight here with Owen Schroyer, and we're going to be uh, covering the first hour and the second hour. We're going to talk about uh, that color revolution in more detail, but also about the good news that is breaking out throughout the economy. As we mentioned at the top of the hour, we got the dollar at a 14-year high. We've got the largest reserve in America discovered in oil. And, of course, that wasn't supposed to happen. The CIA has been trying to sell us the idea of peak oil for a long time. Why would that be? Well, it's a tool of political control. You know, Owen, as I'm, I'm listening to this, and we see this organization that uh, mirrors the, the government's uh, five levels of threat, you know, DEFCON 1 through 5, with 1 being the highest, 5 being the lowest, and 3 was where we were just a few weeks ago. Why? Because we had the Obama administration, and, and we need to realize that with the exception of Rand Paul and Donald Trump, everybody wanted to have a no-fly zone, even the Republicans who were running. They said, we're going to uh, go into a country that we have started a regime change in, that we went in to deliberately overthrow this guy. They invited Russia in to help them. And, of course, you know, Syria is recognized by the U.N. As, as a government, but we just overthrow whoever we wish. And then we're going to tell Russia and Syria that if you defend yourself against ISIS, we're going to shoot your planes down. And we had generals saying, well, you know, uh, you can do that, uh, but you're probably going to start a war with Russia. So three weeks ago, it was at three. And now uh, this private organization that takes a look at it says, look, with all the easing of tensions that we've had here, uh, they're they're taking it down to number five. That's an amazing turnaround. But the media is at war with <laughs> Donald Trump, and we see this in many different ways. This this uh, hissy fit, as we got the article Paul Joseph Watson about the uh, private dinner that he had last night. Well, and think about the hypocrisy of the radical left right now, who's supposed to be for peace. You know, the peace nicks out there, are all on the left. But if Hillary Clinton would have gotten in, I mean, we're looking at DEFCON two, maybe even one. Yeah. Because she said she'll respond to a cyber attack with a physical war. And she is, is basically already claiming in the Obama administration that Russia was cyber attacking us. So she's basically admitting through her own words that she's going to go to war. 
But Trump gets in, as you pointed out, it drops to DEFCON 5. So where are the peaceniks? Where are the Trump protesters who say that the Republicans, that we are the warmongers, right in the face of looking at the DEFCON level dropping and World War III becoming less of a serious issue in the near future? I'll tell you where they are. We've got the people. Remember, going back to 1947, we had the doomsday clock. And it was something that was, uh, you know, right after World War II, there was a nuclear scientist and his wife. Uh, who was an artist, and they came up with this concept, the doomsday clock, to get people concerned about the threat of nuclear war. And it was an imminent threat at that time. We had the Cold War. Uh, both the U.S. and Russia were building up their weapons. Uh, nobody really knew what was going to happen with that. It was unprecedented. We'd never seen that before. Going back to January 2015, and they announced that yesterday they were going to meet and decide whether they are going to move the hands of the clock closer to midnight or not. Uh, we look at this and going back to January 2015, this article from Washington Post saying the doomsday clock is ticking again. It's now just three minutes to midnight. In other words, the end of humanity. And we'll tell you why these people think that things are worse. It's because Donald Trump is there and because of policies that have nothing to do with nuclear war. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Lauren Schroer, and we're going to be talking about the press's amazing night that they had last night. As uh, this article on InfoWars points out, the media has a hissy fit over Trump attending a private dinner with his family. The peace is breaking out, prosperity is breaking out all over, but they are going to war with Donald Trump. About that, about his transition team, about so many different things. Before we get back to the news, however, I just want to remind you, we've got a couple of new products that we've introduced at InfoWars. We've got new BioPCA, the ultimate new hair, skin, and nails formula by InfoWars Life. For years, listeners have been asking us to create a game-changing formula that works to give your hair, skin, and nails compounds that they really need. Now, no matter how hard we try, every single day we expose ourselves to toxic chemicals that, weak, that uh, weaken our immune system, that wreak havoc on our skin, on our hair. BioPCA is specifically formulated to help give your hair, skin, and nails a healthy appearance and to fight back against our toxic environment. You know, you're constantly replacing all of those things in your body, just like uh, OcuPower that gives you the nutrients uh, that your eye needs. You know, you're constantly replacing retinal cells. Well, you're constantly replacing your hair, skin, and nails as well. And so you need a constant uh, nutri uh, nutrient substance that's going to help you to do that as well as to combat the toxic chemicals in your environment. Also... Something else that's new that's kind of interesting is the InfoWars Prime app. And we're just uh, getting everybody online here with that. It's an introductory special, uh, $4.99 a month, $44.99 a year. That's half off the standard uh, rate that's going to be there uh, once uh, this introductory special is over. You're going to get exclusive videos direct from me, direct from Owen. Uh, we're going to be letting you know, uh, giving you behind-the-scenes video, a lot more content, a lot more spontaneity about what's happening. All of us are going to have our own channel on this new Prime app. It's going to be a great way for you to keep up with the information. And, Owen, that's the key, isn't it? Because we look at the way the media is spinning this information. You know, Alex just had this report about how DEF CON uh, people looked at this and, and lowered it from three to five because we had our, our government uh, uh, talking about creating a no-fly zone and shooting down Russian planes just a couple of weeks ago. Now with Donald Trump uh, and Vladimir Putin actually talking. Imagine that. Uh, Leaders of countries talking to each other instead of threatening to kill each other. Which is the first promise, if you want to say, I guess it wasn't really a promise, the first uh, thing that Donald Trump came through on his word about. He went on Michael Savage's radio show. He said, if I get elected, I will talk to Putin before inauguration. He did it. So he's one yeah. for one. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, they continued to ask him, well, you know, what are you going to do about Obama? You didn't really mean that. You didn't really mean the, uh, the you're going to build a wall or do anything about immigration. And he goes, no, I really meant it. I really meant it. I mean, <laughs> it's like he's just doubling down with all this in time. But when you look at the uh, DEF CON uh, approach, and that's a private organization that is uh, uh, looking and making an assessment. We also have another private organization I was mentioning before the break, the Doomsday Clock people. And everybody remembers them because it's a very uh, iconic uh, uh, thing that was put out there. It was created by a husband and wife team, I guess, kind of like Snopes. And it has the kind of... Well, not exactly like Snopes. <laughs> well, it has the authenticity of Snopes, and I'll tell you why. It was a physicist, <laughs> nuclear physicist, so and <laughs> his artist wife, and they basically were uh, came up with this, this icon, the Doomsday Clock, and as things would uh, uh, get closer to nuclear conflict between the U.S. and Russia, they would move the hands of the clock closer, okay? So we would get to situations like... Um, 
1960, there were seven minutes to midnight. In 1963, there were 12 minutes to midnight. And I don't know what it was in 1962. This Washington Post article doesn't uh, go back and look at that. But that was a bit of the Cuban Missile Crisis, remember? Uh, in October, we thought that we were going to have came probably as close as we ever were to a nuclear exchange. But between uh, it was somewhere between seven and 12 minutes to midnight. But in 2015, they came out and said, we are three minutes to midnight. Wow. I didn't know that we were, you know, uh, twice as close to a nuclear holocaust as we were the Cuban Missile Crisis. No, we weren't. So what happened was in 2007, uh, this Snopes husband and wife team <laughs> decided that they were going to skew this towards climate change. Why? Because in 2007, uh, the community organizer and his color revolution uh, hadn't started yet. They hadn't started overthrowing governments. They hadn't tried to break Ukraine away from uh, uh, the uh, Soviet Union and threatened Russia. And so things were kind of calm in 2007. They needed something to keep this going. So they add climate change. And so that's the thing that's really threatening our world and they move the clock to three minutes to midnight. Remember, it was seven to 12 minutes during the Cuban Missile Crisis. They take it to three minutes because of climate change. That's the way the mainstream media is detached from reality. And here's the ironic thing to me about all of this talk about the doomsday clock, um, climate change, global warming being the end of man. First of all, they ignore the fact that there's nuclear testing going on by the thousands in the last decade. They ignore the fact that geoengineering is going on. Beyond the fact they're flying around their jets talking about climate change as they're adding to the problem, they completely discount nuclear testing and geoengineering, which is admitted programs. Just, just ignore it. And we're going to talk about that more when we come back. They're telling us we can't get out of these climate agreements. So, yeah, you just wait and see. We'll tell you how we're going to get out when we come back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Owen Schroer, and we've been talking about this article that's up on Infowars.com, how the media is freaking out last night because Donald Trump went to dinner privately. And you won't believe what they are saying. Uh, <laughs> the media has a complete hissy fit. This is Paul Joseph Watson's story. Uh, he attended a private dinner with his own family. He skipped out on the press, and he went to Club 21, which is a steakhouse down the street. And, of course, when he got there, he was met with a standing ovation by the crowd that was there. But the press is livid. Uh, they can't believe he would do that. They say he put his security at risk. It's like, no, he didn't. Uh, he took the Secret Service with him, but he didn't take the press. And I've heard amazing things, Owen. I've heard people in the media saying, you know, since 11 when Kennedy was assassinated, uh, we've had the press corps there. As part of, you know, to protect the president, so for his own protection. It's like, really? I, I, I never <laughs> saw the press making, uh, putting themselves up as human shields to protect the president from incoming bullets. Uh, that's the Secret Service's job. They don't really understand <laughs> what their job is, but they're literally at war with this guy. Ignoring everything that's happening, you know, the peace that's breaking out, the prosperity that we see with the dollar, with the stock market with this major discovery of oil, and that's one of the things that really freaks them out with that. Well, I'd like to hear what they say he's in danger of. Is he in danger of assassination? And if so, from who? Are we talking about the peaceful protesters that they talk about, that they justify every day? I thought they were peaceful. Why is that a threat to his security? Is there some sort of secret establishment, some secret society that is control of the planet that would want to take him out of power? Is there some global government initiative that would that would want to end the Donald Trump movement that would want to yeah, kill him? Yeah, called George Soros and the mainstream media. Oh, but but will they mention <laughs> that? I, I See, I doubt they'll mention that. They'll just throw a hissy fit because they didn't get the press that they wanted from Donald. Because, you know, I think the truth of it, David, is they are looking in the mirror at a rotting corpse, the dinosaur dying mainstream media, and they know their only chance to get any ratings is all, at all is to have Donald Trump on. That's right. I mean, that is it. I mean, right. CNN... When they put Trump on, ratings went up. When they would have to cut Trump off because of the things that he was saying and people would switch to Fox or whatever, their ratings went directly down. So I think they're just crying and whining because they're dying and they need Donald Trump to give them the press whenever they want it to keep their ratings afloat. That's right. They had a big, uh, every time there'd be a debate, they'd have a big um, increase. And it was simply because of Donald Trump. They weren't getting ratings uh uh, increases when uh, Hillary was debating <laughs> Bernie Sanders. Uh, but anyway, one of the things that they're complaining about here, and we can leave this tweet here that's embedded in the article, uh, somebody named Sam Stein. I, I don't know or really care who he is, but he's part of the mainstream press, I guess. He says, so D Trump ditched his press pool tonight to grab a steak dinner. This is why he tweeted out, a terrible violation of protocol. Oh, violation of protocol. To have that steak, has, how that dare his he? defenders will probably cheer. And I, yeah, 
he's half right. We are cheering that. He's entitled to have a uh, a dinner without being harassed by the uh, press. Uh, and, and, of course, the mainstream media all cheered when Obama did his own thing, uh, when he got uh, out of his box and, and he did unusual things. Or what NBC about when News? he travels his family all around the planet, yeah. has his mother-in-law staying in the White House on our dollar, too? Let's not forget right. about that. That's, That's right. okay. That's right. NBC News says uh, he left his Manhattan residence without notifying reporters covering him or giving any any indication of where he was going, betraying a horrifying lack of transparency. A lack of transparency. Where were they complaining about Hillary Clinton during the, the campaign cycle when she would disappear for days at a time? That's right. Yeah, very few of them had anything to say about it. And it became an issue when it got up to like uh, 80% of the election cycle. It was like 200 and some odd days. And we started talking about it. I said, hey, we're going to do a thing here where uh, every day that I come on the radio, <laughs> fourth hour or whatever, I'm going to talk about uh, it's, it's been uh, 200 and some odd days since Hillary's last press conference. <laughs> it was Just over like 300 did. at one time. Yeah, they, they, they did this uh, uh, the thing when they had the hostages taken in Iran, okay? They had uh, uh, Ted Koppel would come on the news. Day such and such of the Iranian hostage crisis. And it's like, okay, you have, Hillary holds the press hostage for 300 days, nearly the entire election cycle. They didn't have anything to say about it. And evidently, it started becoming a thing because that's when she put a few minions on board with her on the plane. They rolled her some oranges. Yeah. She, they handed she their cell phones chocolate. off with the questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They'd ask her questions, and she would say, uh, here, have, have a chocolate. You know? And then, and then uh, Project Veritas gets brought up. Okay. Ka, sorry. Press conference over. Got to go. That's but right. you know what the real problem here is, David? I think that they don't want to talk about, but this is what's really bothering them. Do you know how much carbon had to be emitted for Donald Trump to eat that steak dinner? I mean, think about it. They had to they had oh, to till they don't the like land. People eating steak. Exactly. You All had right. to have a cow. I mean, that yeah. car is gonna that cow is gonna flatulate. Oh, that adds to global warming. So just the fact that Trump would even dare have a steak dinner and then night not invite the press corps, outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. And like you were saying, you know, uh, desperate for news about Trump and they can't get enough information out because right now Trump is privately working through who he's going to have in his administration and the transition team. So they're desperate for news. And as uh, uh, Watson points out, uh, CNN had a headline. Trump goes out to dinner tonight. <laughs> Can you imagine being, in this, imagine being in this press corps? All right. Uh, what happened? Uh, Donald Trump went to dinner with his family tonight. All right. How can we spin this? How yeah. can we make this negative? How can we make this bad? That Donald, oh, Donald Trump went to dinner with a fan. What a bad guy. Oh, my gosh. And there's Don Lemon. I can only imagine if you're running CNN and you're watching your news and you look at Don Lemon and that's your future, ooh, that's brutal. You're talking about uh, uh, freaking out because he's having steak. And they freak out because we have steak. They don't want us to have steak. They don't want us to have air conditioning. I like steak. And they are freaking out about uh, climate change. We had France and the UN telling Donald Trump that action on climate change was unstoppable. France and the UN on Tuesday stepped up their warnings to President-elect Donald Trump about the risks of quitting a 2015 global plan to combat climate change. They said a historic shift from fossil fuels is unstoppable. And at the same time, we got the largest discovery of oil in the United States that we've ever had before being put out there. And look, we have to understand, it is very easy for Donald Trump to get out of this climate change thing here, right? You know, John Kerry and all these people, uh, yeah, it, was, it was back, it was uh, October 15th, three weeks before the election. I remember hearing all the stories on the weekend about their uh, agreement that they had signed in Rwanda. And it was going to essentially outlaw air conditioning. And we had John Kerry saying back in July that air conditioning was a bigger threat to us than ISIS. You know, and as I said on the news, uh, John Kerry has never installed an air conditioning or refrigerator unit, but he has installed ISIS. So, uh, <laughs> And he went to Antarctica, so that makes him an expert. That's right, there you go. But this is the insanity of these people trying to protect the world from unicorn farts. And they want to protect us from cows as well because they also have uh, emissions they don't do. want steak. They don't want air conditioning. But look, we have to understand uh, that when you're talking about taking away air conditioning and this thing that they came up with October the 15th, they had three tiers. The U.S. was going to have its emissions of uh, air conditioning uh, coolants capped right away and then decreased. But then you're going to have places like China and India, you know, they're developing. So they need to be allowed a few more years that they can grow their uh, emissions, install more air conditioners before they cap them. And then you've got people like Saudi Arabia, and they were going to be given another few more years. And uh, so that was this, this multi-tiered thing here. But if you read the fine print, what you see is that China 
and U.S. companies had come up with a new refrigerant that was going to replace what was being banned. So it's really all about the money. It's really all about crony capitalism. They've got some new thing that they want to force you to buy. So the way to do it is to ban this stuff. Now, how do we get out of these agreements? We were told by the Washington Post on October 15th that this was a legally binding agreement because what they were doing was amending a treaty that had been legally made a treaty. You know, there's a process for that. The Constitution, you have two thirds of the Senate uh, say, yeah, we're going to uh, uh, ratify this treaty. So they had ratified a treaty uh, under the Reagan administration when we used to pay a little bit of attention to the Constitution. We don't do that anymore. And so they said, well, we amended it. And so now it's legally binding because we amended part of that. And you have to understand, if you amend a treaty, it's no longer the same treaty that you ratified, is it? So you put that in by executive order. And this climate change agreement, Owen, that they agreed to, it was Obama and Kerry that agreed to that climate change agreement. He didn't get the agreement of the Senate. And he explicitly said that he didn't need it. He was going to do it with executive order. And at the time... His critics said, well, you know, there's a danger in that because if you do this by executive order, and I put up a, a report about that on, on the YouTube channel, live by executive order, die by executive order. They said, well, you know, it can easily be undone by executive order if Trump were going to win. But of course, he's not going to win. Hillary will do it. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah, this is, and this is very easy for him to undo this. But that's how it goes right behind closed doors. Somebody's getting rich on this. Somebody, oh, yeah. Somebody's meant to get rich. Just like you've got your story here in the Newsweek magazine from the 70s talking about we've already hit peak oil basically right now. There is no oil left. If, if this magazine was correct, we wouldn't That's have right. any oil. I don't know how it would have gotten to work today. We'd have run but, out in the mid-80s. But yeah. these same people, this is, the most, this is the most ironic thing I've ever heard of in my life. The same people are regulating cow flatulence. This is actually happening. Regulating cow flatulence in order to save the planet. But they won't regulate nuclear bomb testing. They don't regulate geoengineering. You can write. I actually had somebody, they wrote the Canadian, um, I, I don't remember the name of the bureaucracy up there, but they're in charge of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. you know, uh, climate data. They wrote these people. They said, hey, I see these lines in the sky. What are they? They said, yeah, we're spraying, we're spraying lithium. We're spraying aluminum. Yeah, we're spraying this in the sky. Yep. Mm -hmm. it just, so it's like, but, but no, but we need to regulate cow farts and we need to tax you for your carbon emissions, folks. It is total hypocrisy. If you're going to do any of that, please address the thousands of nuclear tests that go on on this planet. Please address the geoengineering that is spraying chemicals in the sky. Don't come to me and tell me about climate change until you quit flying on your jets, you regulate nuclear bomb testing, and you regulate geoengineering. Until that day comes, I'm not listening to any of this climate change nonsense. Yeah, you know, the people who like to scoff at the idea of chemtrails, or persistent contrails that are laid out in a grid pattern. Magically. Uh, yeah, you go back and look at the, uh, the contest that we had uh, shortly after I joined InfoWars here. There was a, a movie contest, and there was a documentary that somebody put in, and it's Skyder Alert, and they had an app that went with it, and they laid it out, the correlation between people citing that and the increases in temperature. Uh, we've got a special report here from Alex uh, Whistleblowers, elected Trump, and he should pardon them. Here's that report from Alex Jones. I support Donald Trump because he has such amazing courage. And when he gets demonized and attacked and lied about, he just basically laughs it off. I also support Trump because I know he really wants to put America first. He believes in this country and he knows we've signed a lot of one-sided trade deals with China and other countries. That if we just do fairer deals, we'll turn our economy back on so that Americans don't have to be dependent on the big corporate welfare state. It can get off the Democratic Party plantation. The problem is Trump also is trying to be, I think, too presidential right now and being nice. He can't trust the weasel, Paul Ryan, that tried to stab him in the back over and over again. And tomorrow, we're about to see the Republicans vote for their speaker. And I know Trump thinks he's taking the high road, but I think he will rue the day uh, that he tried to work with the Republican establishment. I understand he wants to get things done. But on a separate matter, there's something I think the president can do, or at least consider doing, that will really endear him to the real intelligentsia of this country and the world. Many of which are liberal, many of which are conservative. And they're the liberal intelligentsia that supported Trump because they knew how evil Hillary was because of the WikiLeaks. It's the Julian Assange's, it's the Bev Harris's, it's the Snowden's. If it wasn't for WikiLeaks, and it wasn't for Snowden, leading the way with courage to expose 
the fact that we have a criminal elite running Hillary Clinton, you would not have won, sir. That was the final blow. That's what took you over the edge. That's what gave us a window into the seedy, wicked, treasonous, scum-filled systems of the Clintons and the Republican Party that aids and abets them. So I understand in hindsight, that's pretty clear to everybody. And, and look, I understand that three years ago, we had, didn't know at first what Snowden had done, what he'd taken. Now we know Snowden was exposing criminal activity, illegal activity in the government. He did all of us uh, an incredible service and I believe deserves a medal. But think about it. It's the whistleblowing on crimes that helped bring your populist liberty movement to power. So if all is right with the universe and if logic is alive, you should perhaps push for a committee in Congress to have hearings about whistleblowing. It was Obama that persecuted the press, arrested more reporters and, and more researchers and more members of government than all of the presidents before him who were whistleblowing. Please don't continue in the steps of Obama and the Democratic Party and the Republican leadership. You don't have anything to worry about. You're not involved in corruption. You don't even really use the internet. You're very, very straightforward. And so you should be proud to be transparent as you've always been. But bottom line, do the right thing. Explore a pardon for Mr. Snowden and bring him back to the United States. This is the right thing to do. Because quite frankly, it is somewhat of a paradox, almost an oxymoron that it's his actions and, and Assange's actions and other actions that helped bring this country back from the brink of a total globalist takeover. Now, because of your leadership, the American people's courage, and these men and women's courage that leaked the information, the DC leak folks, Guccifer 2.0 and everybody else, it's because of WikiLeaks, DC leaks, Guccifer 2, and all these other heroes and the independent media that we now have a chance to get good Supreme Court justices, that we have a chance to cut taxes and have better trade deals that you're our champion of. So it's only fair that you move forward with at least an investigation into whether or not Julian Assange can be left alone by the United States now and whether people like Edward Snowden can now be left alone and really praise as the heroes they are. I think if there's justice in this world, this should really be strongly looked at. And Mr. President, I know you've got the courage to do the right thing. And David Knight and Owen Schroer here. And as I'm listening to Alex Jones say that uh, Julian Assange ought to be pardoned, that they ought to call off the uh, dogs that have kept him under house arrest in London for a long time. I absolutely agree. One of the things we need to remember about the Obama administration, Owen, is that Obama locked up more whistleblowers and journalists under the antiquated 1917 Espionage Act. Yeah, all I the other presidents he, combined yeah, before exactly. him. So they want to talk about transparency. They want to talk about how the press is treated. I mean, at least he's not locking you up. They, they, they skip on uh, Hillary Clinton not holding press conferences. They give him a pass on locking journalists up, but they get upset about the private dinner. By the way, we're seeing now, obviously, we had stories of fake news being censored off the Internet. People are using InfoWars as the example. Business Insider was one of them on their social media account saying people are using Facebook to determine how to steer away from fake news. Wait a second. Our numbers are growing. People are coming to us because they're sick of fake news, not the opposite. We're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. And, of course, that's something that's been developing for a number of years, the idea of truthiness. Who's going to be the arbiter of who is true and who isn't, who can be censored and who isn't? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Owen Schroyer. Before we get back to the news, and just as we were going to break, Owen started to talk about the Chinese style of censorship. We've had our, our government lusting after a Chinese style of government for quite some time. I remember going back to uh, George W. when he said, gee, I, I wish I could just uh, tell people what to do like they do in China. That'd be great <laughs> as a dictator, you know. And we got a lot of people on the left and the right who think that every four years, Owen, uh, what we're doing is electing a dictator. And uh, no, we're not. Uh, and we need to get uh, uh, get away from that. But before we get back to the news, I just want to let you know about a new product that we've introduced. BioPCA It's the ultimate new hair, skin, and nail formula by InfoWarsLife.com. It's got 14 powerful ingredients, including biotin, zinc, and a proprietary blend of enzymes and collagen. Uh, this formula is a real deal, specially formulated to give your hair, skin, nails a healthy appearance and fight back 
against the toxic environment, uh, the pollutants that you find, and things like shampoos and soaps and body wash and that sort of thing that affects your skin. Uh, you need good quality nutrients, and biotin especially is one of the things people have long recognized as being essential for healthy hair and nails and skin. It also includes a proprietary blend of enzymes and collagen, as I pointed out. So that's a new product that we have. Uh, it's a limited first run, so we'll sell out of inventory very quickly on that. Also, I'll just briefly mention that we have the new InfoWars Prime app. Take a look at that. It's available at an introductory price of half off. And then our Loss Leader Special. You can get the InfoWars Trump is my president for just nine ninety five. That's <laughs> You can wear that and tell people, no, he really is the president. He's mm -hmm. my president, and he's going to be your president, too. Uh, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so that's uh, a great uh, T-shirt there. And, you know, and it's it's already in red, which kind of reminds me of the way the, uh, the British Army used to dress their soldiers in red. So, so you can see them. <laughs> or, yeah, they'll stick out, too. So hopefully we can stick out. But, you know, that's right. have you have you been taking that bio C PCA? Is that why your beard is so thick? That's right. Yeah, that's it. I've noticed your <laughs> no, mustache actually. and beard has been getting nice and thick and lustrous over yeah. there. It must be that bio PCA. You're well, taking. I have taken biotin for a long time. Uh, as part of my regimen of supplements. So I will be shifting over to biotin, uh, uh, to the bio PCA uh, that we sell. So, uh, yeah, because that's got other things in it besides just bio, uh, besides biotin. So uh, that's a great thing to have. I, I take a lot of the stuff that, that we sell. Uh, Brain Force is my favorite thing because I can tell the difference when I've had it and when I haven't had it. Well, you've only got so. three bottles sitting at your desk over there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, and yeah. I always have one ready for me whenever I got to travel anywhere. Well, let's talk about China. Let's talk about the censorship that uh, they're lusting after and the idea that uh, we've seen multiple articles this week from Google and others talking about how they're going to censor individuals, censor terms on Twitter. We just had them go after uh, somebody they identified as the alt-right. I don't know anything about this particular individual. And quite frankly, I don't even identify as the alt-right. I don't, I don't know what the definition of that is. I identify myself as a paleo-libertarian, uh, if you want to put a label on it. Uh, that's about as close as I could get. But they're, they're using censorship and talking about hoax news sites. And this is something that's been going on for a number of years, Owen. Going back, uh, uh, Google has been talking about, we're going to apply a standard of truthiness, you know, <laughs> referring back to uh, Colbert. Uh, we're going to have truthiness, and we're going to be the ones who are going to evaluate whether or not you're legitimate, whether or not your stuff is true. And if we don't like what you're saying, uh, we're going to boot you off of our platform. Well, and, and we'll get more into this on the other side, but, you know... It's not about censorship with these people. It's about control. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's about. And and that's well, censorship's the, their means. Yeah. But yeah, but they'll 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 cry censorship. But it's incredible. As I said earlier, they're using Infowars. I'm seeing I'm seeing all of these uh, major publications going on social media mentioning this story about how they want to get rid of fake news on social media. And Infowars is always one of the main targets when they go after this. Here's an idea. How about we let the people decide what news they want to hear. How about the government doesn't decide what news I would trust? How about I decide as a person? And you know what? The people have decided. That's why they elected Donald Trump. They didn't listen to the mainstream news. And that's why the Alex Jones channel on YouTube now has 1.8 million subscribers and going up. Stay with us. We'll be right back on the other side of the hour. I'm David Knight with Owen Shorter. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Owen Shorter. And just before we went to the break, Owen was talking about uh, Chinese censorship. Coming up in the next segment, we're going to have a special report from Alex Jones. You know, we've had all these reports, Owen of uh, these people at the uh, demonstrations just shouting, Trump's a racist, Trump's a racist, and put a microphone in their face and <laughs> ask them, why? What did he say that makes him a racist? No, oh, he's a racist, he's a racist. Go he's away. Hitler, he's Hitler. Or, or like what they did with uh, uh, with uh, Josh uh, Owens, just kick him in the back. You know, a guy wearing a mask, doesn't want you to see his face, he won't talk to you, he won't explain his position, but when you turn your back on him, he'll kick you in the back with a sucker punch, okay, or a sucker well, kick. You know, I was telling Rob Dew, uh, my boss back there, you know, send me to Trump Tower, send me to L.A. He said, oh, and we, you know, you're going to get beat up out there. We don't want to send you. And I just said, hey, Jesus had to go on the cross. All right. If I have to go out there and get beat up by these loons, if that's what it takes to expose them, even though we've already done that, we'll go ahead and do it. But they're going to keep protesting, I think, David. Well, Alex is going to have a report coming up in the next segment. Uh, we've actually now finally caught Trump's racism on camera. So now we're going to put some substance to this charge has been repeated endlessly by these protesters for George Soros. But let's get back to your point. Uh, I'll give you the floor again here, talking about what's going on with uh, China, with censorship, with Google. Well, I think that this is very important for people to realize, especially people my age, you know, millennials who have grown up on the Internet. And it's almost like it's it's 
it's a reality for them. And they don't even understand. I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, but that's just how it is. They're attached to their phone. And so what happens in China with the with the way the Internet works, you basically have a social score for your activity online. And this is not what we want, folks. This is Internet government. OK, we already have enough government. We don't need government on the Internet and there was actually an episode of Black Mirror. It's a show on Netflix where they talk about this in the first episode, what the social score is, how it will basically interweave its way into our social fabric and what that will do to us. But President Xi Jinping called for greater cooperation among nations in developing and governing the Internet. Again, we don't want any government over the Internet. And then he says he still wants to respect so-called cyber sovereignty. Trust me, that is complete lip service, folks. They want total control over the Internet. If they just wanted to censor it, they would already have ISIS and all of these operators off of Twitter, off of Facebook, recruiting people to their radical movements. But here's my here's my final question. This is what I asked the people, and, and, and David, you too. Is the Internet broke? Why are we trying to fix the Internet? What is wrong with the Internet? Do do we, the people, the end user, feel that the Internet is broke? Are we complaining about how the Internet operates on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm not. Personally, I'm not. So who is? The people who are being threatened by the Internet. The people in power who need to control the Internet, just like they had to control the television and radio media to keep messages against their control from getting out. And That's what this is all about. Of that. They call it the Great Firewall of China. Essentially, it's a firewall, not for security purposes, but for the security of the state to make sure that uh, dangerous ideas don't find their way. It's not it's not that they're trying to do a denial of service or some kind of a hack. No, the firewall is to keep out ideas that might come into China, ideas that might reform it, that might make it freer. So that's the whole point. A free flow of information, which is what has happened in this. We've seen a revolution this last year or so. Uh, the people waking up, understanding uh, where the globalists are going. Uh, it was interesting, I think, to see, we, we saw earlier this year that after saying, hey, globalism and a new world order, uh, that's just a conspiracy theory. Then they owned it for a while, and they said, no, no, it's real, and it's a good thing. You should want that. It's a, it's a really, uh, you know, this has been a very positive thing, except for you guys and, you know, the working class and stuff. I know you haven't really uh, done too well <laughs> with this, but it really is long term for the good of humanity. It's a good thing. Now they're back to calling it a conspiracy theory again. That's the way these people operate. You want to talk about truthiness? You want to talk about credibility? <laughs> the mainstream media doesn't have... We see poll after poll, and that's probably uh, rigged just like the other polls were by the yeah. mainstream media, saying that 70% uh, of the people don't believe anything they have to say. All right, so it's really probably 90%. Right yeah, we're going to be right back after the break. Uh, we're going to have Alex Jones break down Trump racism caught on camera. We finally now know why he's been called a racist. The controlled corporate media has now made a decisive error. They've been caught red-handed, lying about the election, lying about the polls, trying to deceive the American people. But enough Americans from across the political spectrum, black, white, Hispanic, old, young, woke up to this. And so now the hoax has blown up in their face to the point that even Michael Moore has had to tell the truth that it was white voters that elected Obama who elected Trump. They voted for Obama to prove they weren't racist. They voted for Trump to prove they weren't stupid. President-elect Donald Trump has struck a very presidential tone in the last seven days since he was elected. And the Democrats have stabbed him in the back at every level. They want division in this country. They're the ones pushing this whole race-based narrative. They're the ones that are condoning the racial attacks on whites across the country. It's truly despicable. But when we saw the 60 Minutes piece this weekend and Trump told his supporters, stop it if you're doing it, that was him attempting to give an olive branch to all the people out there that continue to claim he's racist. But they're not going to stop. That's what the political correct culture is, is about class warfare and permanent divide and conquer in this nation. Because the globalists are disenfranchising all of us. They're taking all of our freedoms. They are putting all of our children in debt. And that's why they're using what British intelligence used to control India and other nations, divide and conquer, playing different tribes off against each other. We need to come together, as Martin Luther King said, and stand as a human tribe that loves liberty and freedom and free association. And that's what Donald Trump is promoting. 
The globalists are dissolving our borders and our sovereignty to absorb us into a world government. And that's why they're pushing this narrative that if a nation state exists, it's racist. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the great challenge of the 21st century, whether we can see through this propaganda or not. But the good news is there's been a huge repudiation of this whole race-based narrative in this latest election. And we saw record numbers of black and Hispanic Americans vote for Trump. But instead of the mainstream media realizing that they've so far failed, they have only intensified their efforts now at race painting. But here's some fact-based video integrated in with the 60 Minutes propaganda piece to show you what's really happening. In that report, uh, that woman uh, having a temper tantrum, <laughs> that uh, obese woman, and <laughs> she's cut in Donald Trump saying, stop it. <laughs> a total product of the mainstream media, David. A Talking total about the product. biggest idiots on the planet, let's look at Glenn Beck. Who is saying the alt-right is truly terrifying, going on CNN, trying to ingratiate himself into the mainstream media because his media empire, Mercury, is Wait, melting is he ingratiating down. goblins? Is that what's yeah. happening? Yeah, no, no. Is his, Glenn his, Beck ingratiating a goblin? He's going bankrupt, so he's trying to pave a way for himself to get back into CNN or some other place. Here we have CNN saying, nationally syndicated radio host Glenn Beck said Tuesday that the alt-right movement is, quote, truly terrifying. Adding that while leading Breitbart News, Stephen Bannon, the uh, favorite piñata of the week, uh, gave a voice to white nationalists. There you go. Oh, and I, I never realized until now that Breitbart News was the voice of white nationalism. Did you realize that? I, I've read it quite a bit. I uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, fine work there, I, I'm on Breitbart, uh, Breitbart a lot. And most most of the time, I just see them reporting on news that won't get covered anywhere else. I think what's made Breitbart explode recently is their coverage on the border, mm -hmm. immigration. They've done a lot of great reports on that. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with white nationalism. No, it doesn't. Um, perhaps nationalism. I think that that might be fair. But it's okay. No, no, that's a very different thing than, say, white nationalists. Okay, that's a very racist Ku Klux Klan type of overtone to it. But it's, but it's okay for them, the though. The, the, See, yeah. it's okay for them to race bait, play the race card, mm -hmm. racially divide. But us electing Trump, they say that that's what we're doing, so we're the bad guys. And I mean, again, what we see Glenn Beck doing is the same thing we've seen these, uh, uh, you know, jigglypuffs and snowflakes at all these riots doing, just screaming racism, racism, racism. Without giving any example of it, okay? Thanks, Glenn. And, you know, here's the Washington Post. Now, you would think as much as the Washington Post is opposed to Donald Trump uh, setting up an entire press corps to ferret into his uh, personal and private life. Remember that? They had like a, a dozen or 20 people that were going, that they set aside to look into his, his private life and announced it, proudly announced that. And, of course, the same thing was done in New York Times and others. Isn't it interesting that they didn't really come up with anything? But... <laughs> The okay. biggest dragnet ever. Yeah, you got Washington Post headlines here. How Bannon flattered and coaxed Trump on policies key to, again, this favorite term of theirs, the alt-right. And I'm looking through this article, and they don't have anything at all about racism. Now, you would think that these people had a team of reporters going through to ferret out all the evil in Donald Trump's life. Uh, and Bannon and so forth. If they could have found something about racism that they could have hung their hat on, okay, they would have put it in there. But, you know, Glenn Beck is throwing out these unsubstantiated uh, 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 claims of white nationalism. Uh, the most damaging thing they could do, I guess, they lead out their article by talking about how after 130 people were killed in Paris by Muslim jihadists, which they won't use that uh, term. They just say terrorists, okay? Uh, they say Trump faced sharp criticism for saying the U.S. had no choice but to close down some mosques. And they talk about how Bannon helped him to... Uh, walk that comment uh, back by saying, were you actually saying you need New York City Police Intelligence Unit to get a network of informants? I guess uh, Trump said, that's what I'm saying. Uh, you need to be prepared to allow, uh, to, uh, you're not going to allow an enemy within to tear down this country. And he said, yeah, that's right, that's not going to happen. Well, look, understand a couple of things, as we've pointed out many times to the left, but they still don't seem to understand Islam is not a race. Secondly, if you have a so-called church that is preaching the kind of jihadi Islamic terror that uh, is preached in some of these mosques that results in 130 people being killed in, in one town. Uh, that's not a mosque that should be allowed to exist. That's not racism. That is hatred. That is terrorism. That's violence. We need to understand the difference between terrorism and religion. Okay, maybe go back to the dictionary. Spend a little time there. Washington Post, New York Times. Uh, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. Look up the words uh, terrorism. Look up the words religion. And we also need to understand that Sharia law 
that is promoted by these people like Sharia Khan that Hillary Clinton had introduced her, or not introduced her, but he spoke about three or four people before her at the DNC. Uh, the, the guy who, uh, the gold star family that they tried to hang that on Donald Trump for the longest period of time. This is a guy who has been uh, an avid commentator about Sharia law. He's written volumes about Sharia law. And you understand that Sharia law is antithetical to everything that we have here in the West, that you hear the liberal establishment constantly crying about the separation of church and state. No, Sharia law is about the consolidation of church and state. Okay, and that's what Sharia Khan was about. He's not simply uh, the, the father of somebody who was a Muslim who was killed in a war. No, he's promoted Sharia law, and Hillary Clinton and the left have promoted him and used him uh, to uh, beat Donald Trump with. So if there was any racism, uh, if it was uh, white nationalism, Glenn Beck would be on that. Well, and Glenn Beck, you know, he thinks he's Jesus. He's going to say that he's going to anoint Ted Cruz. Of course, he miserably failed on well, that. Prophet is what he is. Well, and he buried his face into a bowl of Cheetos. We can never let him live that down. But he says that if if Americans acquiesce to letting Bannon in the White House, then we are racist. So what is Glenn Beck calling for? Is Glenn Beck, I mean, just like Van Jones, are are we going to hold them responsible for these people out on the streets destroying property, breaking the law, yeah. uh, burning things, looting? Because, I mean, they're being told... It's racist. We're racist, so they're trying to fight racism. It's a total lie. It's a total myth. Not the people at the top. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Uh, stay with us uh, for another segment, Owen. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Owen Schroyer. I'm going to get back to the news. Before we do, real quickly, I want to remind you, we have a Lost Leader special at InfoWars Store. Uh, we have Donald. Uh, we have Trump as my president. No Donald on it. Trump is my president shirt. Just nine ninety five. Drastic reduction in price. Uh, that's a great way to take a stand. You know, either way, that was going to be an interesting uh, shirt. You know, we could have said, well, you know, uh, I'm not too happy about uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, Trump represents uh, what I wanted in the presidency if he had lost, but he didn't lose. And he is our president in spite of all of the uh, uh, George Soros operatives, the rent -a mob the uh, AstroTurf uh, uh, demonstrations and violent demonstrations that we see, which is really... Uh, part of a color revolution. We'll talk about that a little bit here. We're also going to talk, uh, coming up in the next segment, uh, why don't you stay here with me, uh, Owen, and we'll talk about uh, peak oil. And we'll talk about this 1979 uh, Newsweek magazine. And I want to have you here because you did that report on um, the special commemorative edition by Newsweek. I mean, they're still up to this kind of stuff. Here we are like 40 years later. Uh, they're still doing the kind of nonsense. <laughs> I, I can't believe these people are still in business. I guess... You know, <laughs> CNN will never go out of business either. Uh, but uh, they're still in business, and so they put out a hoax uh, issue, you know, about Hillary Clinton. You talked about that quite a bit. And I wanted to read for people what was on the inside cover of that and give people an update on what's going on with the commemorative edition. Because they had one for Hillary, but they didn't have one for Donald Trump. They had a design and an idea that they might do one for Donald Trump. But they were so convinced from listening to themselves that Donald Trump wasn't going to win by every metric. And we talked about this so many different times. By the number of crowds, by the voting in high schools, by uh, AI projections, by other models that political scientists had put out, by every metric, Trump was massively ahead. And yet, these people continued to put out these quote-unquote scientific polls. And there's a lesson for us in their predictions about oil. There's a lesson for us in their predictions about climate change. All of these so-called experts, they always refer back to this argument from authority. Listen to me. I am a climate change scientist, okay? Well, we've had the... Alex has interviewed multiple times the founder of the Weather Channel, and he said, hey, when we were doing... A, how, how can they say that they're going to have such and such a percentage of climate change when, when he was doing it, they had the little mercury thermometers, the analog thermometers... And you have parallax error there. You're not going to get the kind of accuracy of a one degree temperature change. But now they're saying a one degree temperature change is going to be apocalyptic. And that's nonsense. Uh, again, real quickly, let me tell you the other things that are up at uh, InfoWars Store. We also have a new product, BioPCA, that is rolling out now. 14 powerful ingredients, including biotin, zinc, and a proprietary blend of enzymes and collagen. Uh, the real deal, biotin is a long-recognized um, key ingredient to... Uh, a, a nutrient for your hair, for your skin, for your nails. Uh, people have known this for quite some time. And I've taken biotin just by itself, but this has got so much more. It's got other enzymes, collagen, and a proprietary blend. 
And uh, just as we've seen with other things uh, with InfoWars, always take it up a level. This is a new product. It's an introductory run. We'll run out of inventory very quickly. We usually do small introductory runs of these new products. So uh, take a look at that at InfoWarsLife.com. And also, finally, we have the InfoWars Prime app. And that's something that you're going to be seeing exclusive content, uh, feeds from me, from Owen, from Alex Jones, the rest of our reporters, behind-the-scenes action, uh, exclusive offers that are going to be offered to people there. Right now, you can get that at half off with an introductory price. So uh, take a look at the Apple app or Android Play Store to download that and subscribe today. That's where you can get that app for your phone. Owen, when we were uh, talking in the last uh, break, we were talking about some of the transitions that are happening here, how they're attacking uh, Bannon, who was uh, head of Breitbart. He has um, uh, been the focus of everybody's attacks on him. But I think as we're looking at the news cycle, uh, they're really trying to find out something about Trump. They're so desperate that they freak out when he goes to get something to eat. But the only other thing they have to talk about besides his visit to the steakhouse is his transition team. And we had some very important information that broke on this. You know, at the end of the week last week, we had Chris Christie removed from the uh, uh, team. He was head of the team. And he was replaced by Vice President-elect uh, Mike Pence. And now we see from the Hill that Pence is reportedly kicking all the lobbyists off the transition team. And that's a report from the Wall Street Journal. I think that's a very positive re, uh, development. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. And for all of the people, the liberals, the people on the left who have been fighting to get big money influence out of Washington, we've been telling you Trump is your candidate. And now you have his vice presidential pick, Mike Pence, coming in and delivering what, or at least winding up for a haymaker against the influence of big money in Washington. That's right. That's right. We're going to talk a little bit more about that on the other side. And then we're going to talk about... Newsweek. And maybe they should spell that W-E-A-K. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alice Jones Show. I'm David Knight here with Owen Schroyer. And we were talking before we went to the break about the uh, Trump transition team. Developments in that. Uh, Mike Pence, of course, being put at the top of that as Chris Christie was removed. Uh, possibly because of the uh, bridge gate. I'm sure that had a, a lot of things to do with that. Uh, but also, Chris Christie had put a lot of uh, lobbyist on this transition team. And the first thing that Mike Pence has done, according to the Wall Street Journal, an unidentified source, source within the transition team told the Wall Street Journal that Pence's first move since taking over from Chris Christie has been to remove all lobbyists off the transition team. I think that is a very positive development. Of course, one of the people uh, that has disappeared off of that transition team, I don't know if they were including him as a lobbyist or not, because usually these people who work for the intelligence state uh, like Mike Rogers, usually as they um, retire, they get a job as a lobbyist or uh, they get off of Homeland Security uh, like Michael Chertoff and they go uh, join the company that makes the uh, body scanners and then have masses of them all lined up uh, to be installed in the airports just as we have a underwear bomber. Isn't that convenient? You know, so you have that type of thing. So I don't know if uh, Mike Rogers, former congressman, uh, and he was, as the Washington Post says, uh, this is Washington Post, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think uh, they, they call him a widely respected voice on national security. Well, I don't respect him. Uh, I, I, this is the guy who was Mr. CISPA, uh, Cyber Intelligence Security Protection Act or whatever. They, he continued to push that through uh, they kept changing the name. Uh, they tried CISPA two or three times. They had ACTA, SOPA, PIPA, all these different ones. The whole point of this was to allow the companies that uh, collect information on you to turn it over to the government, which they're already doing, okay, but they don't have uh, legal immunity for doing that. So you could sue them for spying on you and turning that over to the government. So what they wanted to do was not to protect your privacy, not to protect the Internet, not to protect cybersecurity. They wanted to protect the companies that were snitches for the surveillance state. That was the point of Mike Rogers. That was the point of CISPA. And they finally got it through uh, as CISA. Okay, they finally got that run through. So now uh, they can uh, turn that information over. And uh, you can't do a thing about it because they've now protected their corporate snitches to spy on you. And as we talked about earlier... Uh, Google and uh, others uh, controlling content, uh, talking about how they'd like to set up a, uh, a Chinese-style surveillance. We have to understand the importance of um, the geospatial intelligence, which is the fastest-growing field. We talked about this with Jade Helm. 
if they have your metadata. They keep saying, don't worry, we're not collecting your phone calls, we're not collecting your text messages, we're not listening to all that stuff and reading your emails. No, we're just collecting your metadata. And as William Benny, who's been on the show multiple times, has pointed out, the metadata is far more valuable to them than that. Because they can go through your metadata algorithmically, and they can map you politically, religiously, and geographically, they can know everything about you and all of your friends, and that gives them a greater predictive uh, uh, capability, pre-crime capability, than they would if they were to listen to your texts and the message. They don't want that stuff. They want the metadata, and yet they tell us, don't worry, we're only going after the metadata. Uh, that's the real key thing. So I see that as a very important thing. But what I wanted to say, Owen, was one of these quotes that was embedded in this article from the Washington Post, they talked to a guy who used to be a counselor to Condoleezza Rice when she was Secretary of State, and his name is Cohen, Elliot Cohen. And, of course, um, he is one of the never-Trumpers. Uh, now, I don't know if this is true or not, but he said, after an exchange with the Trump transition team, I changed my recommendation. I say, stay away. They're angry, arrogant, and screaming. You lost. And he said, we met with them, and he says, it was weird, very disturbing. It was accusations. You guys are trying to insinu insinuate yourselves into the administration. All of you lost. I think that's a very positive thing, because they did lose. The never-Trumpers, the establishment at the top, the GOP establishment is no different from the Democrats. They all allied together. They all opposed Trump, and they did lose. And now they are trying to insinuate their way into the administration. The globalists uh, are trying to do this. The elitists that have given us these disastrous policies that have campaigned as the phony opposition. And then when we voted for them to uh, protect the borders, get rid of Obamacare, they, they got elected on that basis and then said, now we're not going to do anything. So I take that as a very positive uh, uh, development. Well, Rogers is probably one of those guys that they're going to try to infiltrate into a Trump administration mm -hmm. in order to have somebody in it as a security blanket to try to keep some of these policies, keep some of these agendas churning. Or people like him Trump. now that he's left, yeah. Right, right. And that Cohen, I feel like there was a relation to David Brock. It might have been a different Cohen, but I remember when I was doing my research into David Brock, there was an E. Cohen that kept popping up. So I'm not sure if that's uh, yeah, there's Elliot, a connection yeah. there or uh -huh. not. Yeah. But, you know, of course they're going to try to demonize Trump at every turn. Right now, I think we're seeing positive things coming out of the transition camp. I think... You know, Bannon is a good appointment. I think Pence um, and, and what he's done with his power to remove the lobbyist is a good thing that I would think universally people would accept this from the left and the right. But that's not how it's going to be, you know, spun and twisted inside of the media complex that's mm -hmm. run essentially by the government that we're dealing with. And that's what we see from The Washington Post. You know, we, their headline says transition is, quote, going so smoothly, tweets Trump. And then you have them talk to the people who are part of the long-term establishment, former CIA directors and everything. Oh, they're not doing this right. Yeah, you start with the core of the people who brought you in, but then you have to reach out to us. We have to say, one of the things that sabotaged the Reagan administration was from getting many of the things that he promised to get done. I remember Ron Paul supported Ronald Reagan when he ran in 1976. He was one of his first supporters, strong supporter. And then Ronald Reagan pledged things like, hey, he was going to get rid of the Department of Education, which Jimmy Carter had just created. As I've said before, the Department of Education under Ronald Reagan was still Rosemary's baby in the crib. And he should have strangled it right there, okay? <laughs> but instead, under a Reagan administration, it was nurtured and it grew into an adulthood, okay? And it's now this oppressive thing that we, uh, Donald Trump is looking at a, a person to uh, take over uh, that position over the uh, Department of Education who is opposed to Common Core. But that's how bad it's gotten. Uh, well, common core but they could do things like that but reagan got sabotaged even though he wasn't a member of the council on foreign relations he wound up with over 300 people from uh who were cfr put into the state department and they basically uh, took over his foreign policy well and let's talk more about a trump transition here into actually uh, administration and this is a story that you shared with me is trump's one trillion dollar privately funded infrastructure plan feasible this, to me, is kind of a representation of the type of transformation we're going to see under a Trump presidency. And I'm curious what you what you thought about this. One trillion dollar infrastructure investment to rebuild highways, bridges, tunnels, airports, school and hospitals. I think, first of all, I think that that's brilliant. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm sick of driving on a road that's busted to hell. And then I got to get my car repaired every year because I don't even have a smooth road. Same thing with the bridges, tunnels. Trump talks about the airports all the time. But he's but the interesting thing about this plan, David, and this is where I'm curious to get your thoughts. I think that there is a perhaps a danger 
of crony capitalism here mm. in the plan that he's brought forth. My problem with it. But if we have a transparent way of bringing on these private investments, which is what he's talking about doing, which I think is great. It's not going to build the debt that this country has already with this trillion dollar investment coming essentially from private institutions that receive tax credits. So you obviously have a risk of crony capitalism here. But if this is done transparently, if the American people uh, see that there was a fair uh, bidding process or selection process to choose the best person, which is what what Trump wants, he's always said under budget, ahead of schedule. Uh, so this is the type of thing I think is a, a transition that the American people need to keep their eye on as well. How he goes about rebuilding the infrastructure, where he's getting the money. This is something we need to make sure is still transparent. But I think that what you're seeing from Pence, what you're seeing um, out of the, um, out of the um, I'm, excuse me, Trump camp already, the things that Kellyanne Conway has said, you know, I, I think that he intends on being transparent with this, mm -hmm. allowing the American people to take a look into what it is he's bringing uh, to the table with where he's getting the money. So even though I think this is a risk of crony capitalism that you would agree with, it also could be very beneficial. We could actually rebuild our infrastructure without increasing our debt, something that no president has figured out how to do yet. Well, yeah, I, I guess uh, I would differ with you and I would differ with Trump on this uh, because I look at this trillion dollar infrastructure rebuild. And it's not that our infrastructure doesn't need to be rebuilt. It's not that we don't need to invest in it. But I'm concerned about the crony capitalism. I'm concerned about toll roads. And I think that toll roads are going to take a toll on uh, the working people of this country. I think it's going to take a toll on uh, whether we have a few people, mostly multinational foreign corporations, that are going to wind up owning America rather than Americans themselves. And I think it's one of the few things uh, that the government ought to do. Not the federal government, by the way. There is no authority for the federal government. To do. And this is something that was brought up uh, prior to the Civil War. And Civil War was about so many things. People don't understand that. We have this dumbed-down version of the Civil War that was simply about slavery. No, it's about a lot of things. One of the things that the people uh, were talking about prior to the Civil War was the idea of things like the Erie Canal. Uh, very useful thing. Great thing at the time. A great way to move uh, products when they didn't have railroads, when they didn't have uh, automobiles, <laughs> they didn't have a federal interstate system. But the people who didn't live in Pennsylvania said we should not be billed to build this, a uh, charge to, uh, to build this infrastructure in Pennsylvania. People in Pennsylvania ought to be building that. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely right. And I think that's something that we can invest in. When we look at the Marshall Plan that rebuilt uh, Europe after World War II, uh, that was a debt that was incurred, that was money that was invested, but that was building something that was productive as opposed to what the World Bank under people like um, Robert McNamara did after he finished uh, destroying a, <laughs> a large part of America and the American military with the Vietnam War, he went on to the World Bank and uh, was accused of rent seeking because what he did was he extended loans to the third world, not to build infrastructure, but to build a welfare state. And all that was doing was creating a uh, turning people into serfs. OK, it wasn't making them more productive. All it did was. Uh, put them in a situation where they owed money to the World Bank. And we see how that is working out throughout Europe, uh, throughout uh, Greece and Italy and these other places. Now they have turned that rent-seeking uh, tactic onto the first world. And one of the ways we see that happening here in America is toll roads. And we need to look at what's happened here in Texas and where I came from in North Carolina. In both of these places, what we've seen is a Spanish corporation that typically runs these uh, toll roads. And uh, they, they did it here in Texas. And we have to understand that as they built this toll road in Texas, they raised the speed limit famously to 85 miles an hour. But at the same time, they dropped the speed limit uh, from 65 to 55 on adjacent roads. They got an agreement from the Texas Department of Transportation that they would not build uh, new infrastructure, that they would not uh, in, uh, improve the adjacent roads because they wanted to have everybody essentially forced onto their uh, toll roads. And people here in Texas don't like toll roads. We don't like having to pay a yet again when we've already paid taxes at the pump. Nobody's riding these things. So they've gone bankrupt. Now, is that a bankruptcy for the Texas, the people who live here in Texas? No. That uh, Spanish corporation may turn it back over to the banks. They'll flip this and resell it just like all the banks did our homes when they took them uh, during the mortgage crisis. They're not going, the banks will continue to make money off of this. It's the American taxpayer at the federal level 
that is going to pay for this. So all of you who don't live in Texas, you're going to pay for the failure of our Texas toll road that's going on here. And there's another one that's going on here in America, in Texas, and that is a high-speed rail project that is going between Dallas and Houston. This is a Japanese company that is trying to put this through and literally run roughshod over people's property, dissecting these farms that are in the middle of it. Uh, running these people's lifestyle, taking it with eminent domain. I'm very opposed to that sort of thing. I'm very opposed to having this turned over. And the way this happened in North Carolina is there's this thing called the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, uh, ALEC. And this is something that really is popular with Republicans, especially. And they go to these conferences. They have these wonderful uh, conferences at uh, beachfront property. They go hang out for a week, and they give them these bills. And all they have to do is fill in the name of the state at the top, and sign it at the bottom and introduce it. So this is the legislation that's written for them by these crony capitalists, and that's the way they got the toll road approved in North Carolina that they may still build, even though we've seen this thing go bankrupt here. Now, what I'm concerned about with this uh, trillion-dollar build-out that Donald Trump has got is that we're going to see that same sort of thing. I did a report earlier about uh, we stopped the TPP, but we got to watch out for the PPP, and it's the private public partnerships. We have libertarians who say government can do no good and business can do no wrong. The socialists flip it around. They say government can do no wrong, business can do no right. What really is dangerous are these private public partnerships where you get government and business working together. And that's when you see the worst of government, the worst of business. And what we see coming towards us, and we ought to talk about this, uh, uh, these, these driverless cars that Mercedes is, is worried about getting bullied, okay? When we look at uh, this crony capitalism that is part of TPP. You've got a few uh, corporations and individuals who want to run, own everything. They want to turn the rest of us into, uh, they want to give us a, a basic income, but they're not going to let us have jobs. They don't want us to own our homes. They're going to force us into the cities under Agenda 21. They want to own and control everything, including our transportation. And you should be very concerned about toll roads, just like you should be very concerned about these self-driving cars. That is an effort to take over your transportation. It is war against the people by just as globalism and the elite. It is that is another tactic of this. And the way when you're at war with people, what you do is you take over their their infrastructure. And that's what I'm very concerned about. Well, people have always told me, don't forget about the forest through the trees. Right. And for the last year and a half, we've been staring at the exact same tree, the presidential election, and for myself, kind of forgetting about the forest. And after Trump won, I've been, I've been asking myself, how do I transition as a journalist? How do I transition here as a reporter for InfoWars? And I'm curious, is this the transition that we're seeing? Are, are, are we going to actually be able to come on air here and instead of try to bring attention to Fukushima, the fluoride in the water, everything we've been covering – are we going to actually have the opportunity to come on air here and debate about what's best for the American infrastructure? Yeah, Are we going to sure. actually be able to come on here with you, the listener, we, the people all together and actually determine our country's future, determine our country's fate again? Is this the reality? Is this a transition? Is this now what I do as a reporter at InfoWars? Obviously, we still want to fight, you know, all the stuff I mentioned and bring awareness to it. But I'm curious. I mean. Is that the transition we're seeing? Is, is the Trump administration going to allow the people to actually determine their fate again? Is the fact that the American people have been awoken by this presidential election mean that now these types of debates are going to be injected at the dinner table when you're out with your friends, uh, drinking, having a good time, whatever it may be? I mean, that's exciting for me to think about. These are the debates now that we can actually have, and then maybe we can actually see some of the results manifest itself in our infrastructure, in our foreign policy, in our uh, border policy, everything. I mean, I feel like perhaps there's a renaissance now where we actually feel that we can control our future, and now we're motivated to do something about it. We don't have the Obamas, the Bushes, the Clintons, who already have the predetermined fate in the office. Now we have someone who's willing to work with the people, willing to hear from the people, willing to put new people in there as part of his transition team. And I think the key thing is, is that Trump is willing to listen to opposing views. I think we see that with his appointment of uh, Priebus as well as Bannon, the chief of staff. We have seen this in other ways. The people like Obama and Hillary Clinton, they're going to do what Goldman Sachs and the bankers tell them. Hopefully we can and have policy decisions. Yeah, and Soros. Hopefully we can have policy decisions on things that we disagree with Trump about, and maybe we can convince him. Maybe not. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight here with Owen Schroyer. In the next hour, we're going to be joined by, um, actually, uh, uh, Owen is going to be replaced by uh, Leanne McAdoo. So we're going to have a transition right there. 
Before we go back to the news, I just want to re uh, remind you that we have a new app, InfoWars Prime app. You can find that at the Apple App Store or the Android Play Store. Uh, it's a way that you're going to be able to get videos directly from me, from Owen, from Leanne, from Alex Jones, all of our reporters. You'll get behind-the-scenes action, exclusive offers that you'll see there. We also have a new product, BioPCA, which is a specially uh, formulated blend of biotin, zinc, and enzymes and collagen. Uh, this is a way to protect your hair, skin, and nails. That's an introductory offer. So we do um, an introductory product. So we do small runs. We'll run out of that fairly quickly. So take a look at that. Uh, but that's a great product. It's something everybody needs to uh, take a look at. Protect yourself against the toxic chemicals that are in your environment, especially shampoos, uh, soap, uh, things like that, that uh, you're putting on your skin and your hair. This is a way to protect it, to give you the nutrients that your body needs to to regrow your hair, your nails, your skin, which are constantly being replaced. Also, we have a loss leader. Um, Trump is my president t-shirt, now down to just nine ninety five. So that's a great deal, a loss leader. You'll find that at InfoWarsStore.com. Uh, now, Owen, as we were talking in the last segment, you know, we were talking about this trillion-dollar infrastructure plan uh, that, that Trump had. And, you know, I understand, as we were saying during the break, it's very attractive to... Roll this thing out as uh, using other people's money. You know, let, let's let the uh, individuals finance this, banks, Wall Street. And I'm sure that's a lot of what's behind the uh, optimism in the stock market that we've seen is this trillion dollars that people look at and say, hey, we can put this infrastructure here. But I think there's an important thing to think about, and that's the Constitution. You know, and I would say to Mr. Trump, this isn't your job description. Uh, this is, there's no authority for this in the Constitution. Do us a favor, cut our taxes. Leave the money with the individuals, with the states. Individual jurisdictions can then decide how much they want to spend on the infrastructure. People can pay for it themselves. They'll have more money to pay for it themselves. He's proposed the largest tax cut that any president has ever proposed. That would alone, by itself, rebuild America. And uh, it's a, a bigger tax cut than we've seen uh, from JFK uh, and a bigger tax cut from Reagan. Reagan did more than JFK, and both of those were... Uh, really did rebuild the country. As JFK said, a rising tide lifts all boats. But in so many different ways, this is something that needs to be done at the state level, at the local level. People can decide how much money on a basis by basis uh, level, how much money they want to invest in the infrastructure. Instead of having Washington decide where a, a, a bridge is going to be built. We've seen that before, the bridge to nowhere, okay? We don't want to see that kind of corruption, crony capitalism, and influence being sucked into Washington. The problem with corruption is that there's too much power in Washington. There's too much money in Washington. It becomes a black hole. It draws in the most corrupt people. So if you want corruption in your administration, if you want crony capitalism, go with a trillion dollar uh, uh, build out of this infrastructure and that will bring the corruption and the crony capitalism there to Washington. A much better approach is to go with what you originally had, which is to cut taxes. And we don't want the concentration of wealth. We don't want the ownership of our country in the hands of a few multi-billionaires, a few multinational corporations like the people who run our toll roads. And again, the transition that I'm feeling here where instead of, you know, a George Bush ramming the Patriot Act down our throat, instead of Barack Obama ramming any of his executive orders down our throat, this is Trump floating an idea out there. Let's see if it sticks. See if people like it. David Knight doesn't like it. Maybe I like it. But we're out here having a debate about it. And the fact that we got Trump in office, I think, has empowered Americans to feel like they actually have a stake in the future. They actually have a say in what Trump's administration will do, what policies they'll bring forth. So he floats this idea out there. People reject to it. They don't like it. Then he probably wipes his hands with it. And if it sticks, maybe he tries to implement it. That's, the, that's what I feel the difference is right now. Well, let's you like so. it or not. He, he's his own man. So he can change his mind and he doesn't listen to these other people as a robot. Stay with us. We'll be right back on the other side of the break. We'll talk about bullying self-driving cars. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Owen Schroyer. In the next segment, we're going to have a special report from Alex Jones. Uh, InfoWars announces a fake news analysis center. Uh, so we'll <laughs> see what that is. Uh, but that's going to be coming up at uh, the, just after the break. Uh, Leanne is going to be joining me. And in the fourth hour, we're going to have Roger Stone joining us uh, through the fourth hour. Uh, let's talk a little bit, Owen, about uh, the concerns of uh, the Mercedes-Benz CEO that uh, human drivers are going to be bullying robot cars. You know, they asked him, uh, he said, people 
People often ask me why it is taking so long to get the self-driving cars. And he says, well, it's not a technological issue. It's not insurance and liability issues. Well, maybe not. I, I don't know about that. He says, it's not customer acceptance because everybody wants this. It's like, no, we don't. No, we don't. Uh, let, let me tell you something, okay? We're just talking about these toll road situations and everything. The whole point of the self-driving cars is to take away car ownership. And they're going to work, so you're going to have a few companies that are going to lobby in Washington to make sure that they are the preferred vendor. Already you've got Ford and Volvo saying they're going to start, they don't see themselves as selling cars anymore. They see themselves as selling transportation solutions. So what they're going to do is provide public transportation. That is the dream of the government. They have always wanted to control our mobility instead of having us own it ourselves and decide on an individual basis what kind of how much money we want to invest our car what kind of car do we want to drive no they will decide for you what kind of car you will drive they will decide when and where you can go they will decide how much it's going to cost that's why the preeminent uh, company and all this is called uber because they're going to be uber always okay it's a nazi regime of ownership and control and so yeah that's what's really behind it they make more money, understand, if they rent things to you than they do if they sell them to you. So that's why Ford and all these other kind they want to uh, rent these cars to you rather than sell them to you. When Ford brings on its uh, self-driving cars in 2021, they said they're only going to be available for rent. They're not even going to sell them to you. Not for another five years, then you'll be able to buy some of their used cars at that point. But he says, no, the real problem is the coexistence of human drivers and robot cars. You see, it isn't an issue. All you people who constantly say, well, I like the idea that I'd, I'd be able to uh, go on autopilot when I've got this boring commute to work every day. You're not going to be able to coexist with humans and robot cars. It will be one or the other. There is no coexistence. They keep telling us this, but those of you who are fanboys of Elon Musk are not listening. You're not listening. Okay. And here he is again. He said, uh, people uh, are afraid of robots taking over, but he says he is worried that people will bully the driverless cars, that they'll cut in line, that they will bully these cars. And we've already had incidents where we've had, uh, Owen, a guy who, uh, <laughs> they were talking about this in California, a Google smart car. And let's put the smart in quotes. Okay. Setting at a stop sign for five minutes because it couldn't get a four through a four way stop. Finally, they said a guy with white hair beeps the horn. Goes around it in road, road rage and flips him a bird, right? <laughs> and bully. Uh, yeah, he was a bully. He was bullying that Google smart Well, it's not like technology, you know, ever malfunctions, so we don't need to worry about that. But, you know, it's funny, you right. know, Dietmar Exlar, the guy who made the comment, the chief executive of uh, Mercedes-Benz, you think he would be a smart guy, but then he's worried about humans bullying cars. Completely asinine statement. <laughs> but to me, I mean, part of the American dream, in fact, in the very fabric of the American dream, is a car and an open road. You can go anywhere over this beautiful frontier we call America. See the USA and a Chevrolet. It's beautiful. And, you know, it's it's funny about me. Uh, what's funny to this uh, for me, David. So, okay, so he admits, well, we've got this issue, right, between getting the driverless cars on the road. What's the issue? Humans. Yeah. Oh, so let's just get rid of humans. Get rid of the Don't humans. let humans get in the way of progress. Don't let humans get in the way of you making a bunch of money with your driver cars. No, get, just get rid of humans. That's right. That's the solution. The humans have to go. they got to get out of the factories. No free will. They're in no the humans. way. This is the corporate elite. This is the essence of globalism. It came out in the WikiLeaks that George Soros, the White House, Hillary, EU bureaucrats, and others were going to counter the Brexit movement. England never voted to join the EU, so now they're trying to get out. We're going to counter that movement, our sovereignty movement, headed up by Trump, and other sovereignty movements around the world by saying we're racist, we're terrorist, we're evil, and our free speech on the web has to be curtailed. But because they didn't get the presidency won, and because they now won't get the Supreme Court so they can restrict free speech as fast as they wanted to, we now know the new scam. Facebook, Twitter, Google, they've all announced, along with the New York Times, a war on fake news. And they're going to, through the browsers, through the internet service companies, try to block you getting to websites, news sites, and other ad sites that have fake news and information. What's happening is very, very simple. Mainstream dinosaur discredited media that had fake pollsters and fake media analysts and all the disinformation that's been totally repudiated and proven to be a lie. They weren't wrong. They were 
congenital liars on purpose. Their now desperate attempt is to flood the web through third party sites they control with so much fake news and disinformation that it discredits the entire web itself and then they will preside over the false flag they've staged and claim that only they can be trusted when everyone knows they're the most untrusted news sources out there. Before the election debacle, they only had a 6% trust rate, according to the Associated Press, in a national study. Now it's got to be in negative numbers if that's possible. Now, I showed everybody an example over the weekend of Amy Schumer running a so-called advertorial. Looked like an article, but, but, but it was an ad. And in it, she says, oh, I'm not really leaving the country. Let me clarify. So that's lie number one. Then they have this fake newspaper clipping where Donald Trump says, I hate my constituents, I hate conservatives, Fox News has you know, got a bunch of idiots, I'm going to con you, basically. And at the end of the article, she admits it's a fake quote, knowing that 90% of people don't read to the end of the article. That's the fake news being put out on their servers by Google, by Twitter, by Facebook, by Yahoo. A hundred times out of one, and, and I'm being conservative, do I see it where libertarians or conservatives are putting out the fake news? It's these people. So that's their plan. Put out a bunch of fake news, then come in and go, oh my God, look at all the fake news, and then try to discredit the entire web saying only trust us, only come to us. Now there are cases of 100% blatant fake news like the Amy Schumer example. Still, there are other fake news examples, like the one in the New York Times today that attacked yours truly, that said, quote, globalism, a far-right conspiracy theory buoyed by Trump. Globalism is the admitted planetary corporate world system establishing a technocracy for a, quote, world government. This has been in thousands of publications, including The Economist, Time Magazine, The New York Post, uh, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times of London. And now for world government and how great it is and how it's autocratic, how it's authoritarian. Throwing it in our face over and over again, but then coming out in a lengthy seven-page article and saying that I and others literally imagined the TPP, imagined NAFTA and GATT, imagined the World Trade Organization. Talk about fake news. They are denying the main political system and revolution of the last 60 years pushed by the Rockefellers and others. They think you're stupid and you haven't read David Rockefeller's book he published eight years ago, where he openly admits that he's guilty as charged setting up global government. It's all over C-SPAN. We have hours and hours of world leaders saying, we're establishing a world government. But out of one side of their mouth, they say it doesn't exist. Out of the other side, Obama comes out and says, we can't have crude nationalism and we must guard against it. So Alex Jones and Donald Trump say guard against unelected multinational corporate boards taking over like TPP, unpopular on the left and right. And he responds, it doesn't exist even though it does exist, but what does exist is nationalism, and it's bad because Americans or Brits or anybody else, for that matter, Mexicans, Germans, you name it, might be able to vote and kick out the corporations that have hijacked their country. So again, more fake news from the New York Times that lied about Saddam's WMDs, his aluminum tubes, and his yellow cake. Undoubtedly, the new main PSYOP against independent media is flooding the web with fake news and mainstream media putting out fake news and setting themselves up like a super Snopes to be the arbiter of what's real and what's not. That's why Infowars.com is announcing a daily piece for the radio show and the nightly news where we will analyze fake corporate news and fake ads and then archive and chronicle that so that you can search it and index it and counter these people. And I would encourage you as well in the fake news wars to start your own YouTube channel, to start your own radio show, or if you already have one, to make it a daily part of what you do to analyze the deception and the fraud that is the corporate collaborator media. And together, we will kick their ass. <laughs>
All right, welcome back to the live radio show. That was Alex Jones talking about how we're going to set up a new, uh, make it a regular event to anal analyze fake news or faux news. I guess maybe we could call it faux news, <laughs> <laughs> faux news report. And and joining me now is Leanne McAdoo. And Leanne, we had this report that went out last week. We had Paul Joseph Watson wrote this article about Newsweek's special Madam President edition that they put out. I've got a magazine here from Newsweek that is um, goes back to 1979, so it's 37 years old, telling us how we were going to be out of oil within uh, eight years. Uh, this is the kind of fake news that is put out there by uh, the establishment, by the experts, and uh, we'll take a look at this, and I'll give you some shots of this magazine, because this is uh, priceless. And, quite frankly, this Madam President thing is, is kind of priceless as well. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this at the time it went out. And again, you know, they we we called um, uh, we called Newsweek and said, uh, "Is this true?" We've had a lot of reports about this. People who are working at bookstores said, "Hey, look, uh, they're already shipping out as if Hillary Clinton had won uh, this commemorative edition of her presidency." And we said, "Well, what's going on with that?" And I, I Owen was talking to him on the phone. I said, "Ask him if they did one for Trump." I said, "Oh yeah, we did one for Trump." It's like, "Well, can we see it? Can we get somebody that would show us a picture of that?" I said, "Well, well, let me give you this number to call and." Uh, they did. Nobody answered at that at that number. Mm -hmm. But now we find out after the fact, after the fact, we see from the New York Post, they admit that they had printed and mailed and had in stores before the election a special edition of Hillary Clinton as president. They had designed a cover for Donald Trump. You can see that in the tweet that uh, Newsweek eventually put out there. They said, look, we had two of them out there. We had a President Trump, but a Madam yeah, President the conspiracy for her. Theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here's the reality. They had already printed these and shipped them to stores. And then a couple of days after the election, they said, well, we're going to print the Donald Trump thing sometime this week, and right. we hope to have them shipped out to stores next week. Hadn't <laughs> printed them up. So they hadn't done anything on it, is the reality of it. But I want to take a look at this. And of course, you can now get some of those on eBay. It's turning into a very valuable uh, collector's edition. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as you can see here, I printed out some of these things uh, last week. I actually looked into and thought, well, maybe it'd be fun to get one of these things and go through it. Uh, they're going about five or six hundred dollars, and it's like I just wow. can't bring myself <laughs> to pay that for a Newsweek magazine, no matter how absurd it I is. I bet Alex would pay for it. He might. He <laughs> might do it. But I want it. This inside cover here that you can see in the pictures. Take a, a shot of the desk here. Uh, you can see this inside cover here. They President Clinton, and they describe it. And I just want to. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. I just want to hit some of the highlights. They say the 2016 presidential election was unique in a number of ways. This is what Newsweek wrote. It saw the first major female nominee for the highest office in the country, the improbable rise, the kind of demagogue previously unknown in American politics. That would be <laughs> Donald Trump, they are saying. And enough infighting and mudslinging for 10 election cycles. But the tone of the election grew darker and more bizarre by the day as Hillary went high while his supporters went low. Oh. Okay? <laughs> then they go on and say, uh, no stranger to trudging through the mire of misogyny and her career as first lady, senator, and secretary of state, Hillary, president-elect Clinton, Continued to push for an issues-based campaign. Really? Mm. I, I never could never figure out. Never got to those issues, did <laughs> yeah. she? She had an issue with being a woman, and that was the only <laughs> issue she had. And the majority of women voted against her, by the way, interestingly right. enough. <laughs> Even as a handful of Trump's most deplorable supporters, seeing the wide margin that Clinton held among female voters. No, that's not true. And the, and the reality is, and they're, they're upset because white women voted 53% against Hillary Clinton and for Donald Trump. And so they say, well, it was the, the non-white women, though, voted against her. No. There was less uh, women, uh, uh, non-white women, than there were. It was a it was a uh, division between uh, people who were black and Hispanic. But Donald Trump still did better with them than any presidential uh, right. uh, candidate from the GOP previously. And it's because they're beginning to wake up to the fact that the Democrats have betrayed them by playing this racialism. And yet, you know, you look at the woman's vote, or the black woman's vote, or the Hispanic woman's vote. That was skewed by the massive uh, capture of, of those groups by um, the, the political parties. But then they go on to say, Americans across the country roundly rejected the fear and hate-based conservatism put out by Donald This is Newsweek, and nope. they're commemorative edition. <laughs> this is how biased and, and uh, these people are. As the first woman in history to ascend to the presidency, arguably more experienced than any other incoming president. Out of corruption. More, more than <laughs> Jefferson, more than <laughs> Madison, more than... <laughs> Anybody, okay, it's Hillary Clinton. I mean, she stands in the class by herself. And then they finish it out with their favorite thing because they set this up at the Javits Center because it had a glass ceiling, right? Mm -hmm, right. And then they finish, this is their last line, uh, a priceless moment in American history 
the highest glass ceiling in the Western world has finally shattered. And maybe that really did happen when she learned that she had not won the election. <laughs> and she was shrieking in a dark corner somewhere. As she was throwing things at her staff and her yes. husband and uh, everybody else. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to take a look at Newsweek 37 years on. And this is very timely, I think, because today we found the largest reserve is made public of oil in this country that we've ever found. And yet 37 years ago, they were telling us we're going to be out of oil within eight days. It's Newsweek, W-E-A-K. We'll be right back with Leanne McAdoo and David Knight. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Leanne McAdoo. We're taking a look at fake news. Uh, before we get back to that, I just want to remind you of some of the specials we have at InfoWars Store and InfoWars Life. At InfoWars Store, we have a loss leader special. We have the Trump is my president. Yes, he is. Like it or not, yeah. those of you on the left. We're going to talk with Leanne. We're going to talk about the uh, alt-left uh, attacking the alt-right right now, uh, left and right again. But uh, we're going to talk about that coming up. Before we do, we're going to talk about the real fake news, uh, Newsweek and others. But still, tell them that Trump is your president. They, they haven't gotten that message yet. Mm -hmm. And they just can't bring themselves to uh, embrace that. We also have a new product at uh, InfoWarsLife.com. Bio PCA. We call it bio because it is biotin, zinc, and a proprietary blend of enzymes and collagen. Uh, this is a formula is very helpful for you in terms of giving the nutrients that your body needs to have healthy hair, healthy skin, healthy nails. And of course, you are constantly getting exposed to chemicals and the foods that you consume, but also especially in the the chemicals that are in soaps and shampoos that you're putting on your skin and on your hair. So this is a very uh, a very useful uh, nutrient. I've I've taken biotin for quite some time, and uh, but this has even more than just biotin. That's what we typically do in Infowars. Uh, we typically take uh, the core things like they do, like salt, palmetto, um, in um, a Prostagard, and then they'll in add additional ingredients to make it more effective, more absorbable, uh, that type of thing. So, uh, again, we're, we have a new product, BioPCA. It's a limited run because it's our first run, so we always do that on first runs. So it's not going to last very long. Take a look at it at InfoWarsStore.com, and also go to the Apple App Store or the Android Play Store. Take a look at InfoWars Prime app. This is where you're going to be getting exclusive insider information, special live video feeds from me, from Leanne, from Owen, from Alex Jones, from all the reporters, as well as behind the scenes action. And you'll find also exclusive offers that are there for those of you who buy the uh, Prime app. So again, you can find that at either the Apple or Android stores. Well, Leanne, we were talking in the last uh, break about Newsweek and their special commemorative edition. <laughs> Alex had a special report about how we're going to do uh, make it a regular feature to analyze the fake or the faux news that we see coming from the, mm -hmm. the left. I want to play a, a little clip that we've got here of the uh, left blaming fake news uh, for Donald Trump's win. Here's that clip. <laughs> under fire. Critics say it allowed fake news to spread on the platform, potentially reaching millions of people, creating echo chambers and unfairly influencing the presidential election. But Facebook boss Mark Zuckerberg, he is firing back against <laughs> accusations that fake stories on the site influenced the election. A study by BuzzFeed showed top left-wing sites published false or misleading stories about 19% of the time, but top right-wing conservative sites published almost twice as many hoax stories at 38%. The New York Times says exactly Executives at Facebook are questioning the social network's influence on the outcome of the election. <laughs> Some workers at Facebook reportedly are worried about the spread of racist memes. Facebook is accused mm -hmm. of also spreading fake news stories. They weren't worried yeah. about Facebook's influence on the election when Facebook was actively working to get Hillary Clinton elected and switching up their algorithm. And same with Google, setting up an entire a uh, site for her, Eric Schmidt, working behind the scenes to help her get elected. They were totally fine with the way that they were tweaking the election then. <laughs> well, I think what they're doing is that, that they realize that they're coming to the end of the road on mm -hmm. how effective uh, the label of conspiracy theory is. Right. Okay? If, they, if you go in and you analyze something and it challenges the official story, they just dismiss you as a conspiracy theorist, as a tinfoil hat uh, individual, whatever. Now they've got to come up with a new term. And so I think they're kind of focusing on fake news, on hoax news. Mm -hmm. Look, if you disagree with somebody, debate them. Don't just say that it's a hoax, okay? What they have a problem with are sites that they disagree with what's right. being put out there. But it doesn't make it fake. It doesn't make it a hoax. 
And if you want to talk about fake news, let's take a look at Newsweek. You know, in the last segment, uh, we talked about the fake commemorative edition of Hillary Clinton just hammering over and over again how she was a woman. Did you notice that she was a woman? They, they point that out multiple times and how Trump is a misogynist. He's a demagogue. They're hateful. They're dark. They're everything evil. And she defeated that and broke the glass ceiling. Well, here's Newsweek. And again, it's amazing to me these people can still be in business in 37 years. This is a special report. Again, like the Hillary Clinton thing. The energy crisis written in 1979. Because at that point in time, we had Jimmy Carter. The country was suffering from stagflation. There was a general malaise, as they pointed out. From Jimmy Carter, no, the days of America are over. This was just before Ronald Reagan became president, folks. Uh, but no, we were told the best days of America were behind us. There was nothing to look forward to. Everything was moving to Japan, and we were going to run out of oil. And we're going to show you when we come back. I want you guys to focus in on this graph here. Look at this. Crude oil, 1979. We've only got 8.7 years left. Not eight years, not nine years, 8.7. <laughs> These guys know it exactly, eight just like they know that we're going to months. have, yeah, well, they know we're going to have one <laughs> or two degrees of increased temperature, and it's going to destroy the world. Why? Because they're models. We'll be right back. Science. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Leanne McAdoo. We've been talking about fake news. And we're going to talk a little bit more about fake news. Look at this 37-year-old uh, report from Newsweek about how we're going to run out of oil. But before we do that, I don't want to put, some, put this in context with some real news. The real news today, you'll see this on the Drudge Report, is the discovery of the biggest shale oil field in the U.S. ever. They found 20 billion barrels of oil in West Texas. They say it's three times larger than North Dakota's Bakken oil fields. It's the largest U.S. unconventional crude accumulation ever assessed. They estimate the uh, proven reserves that they've just announced at being $900 billion. Now, they believe that in that area, some geologists have said, they believe there's as much as 75 billion barrels of oil. So that means that uh, they've acknowledged one quarter of what they believe may eventually be there, at least one source, the Pioneer Natural Resources CEO said that. If that were true, if it were $75 billion uh, barrels of oil, and that's B with a, uh, uh, you know, a billion, billion with, with a, a B, B okay? <laughs> that would be second only to Saudi Arabia's largest field. So that would be the second largest reserve in the world. And of course, when it comes to coal <laughs> that Obama and Hillary Clinton wanted to destroy, America has more, far more coal than Saudi Arabia has oil. So we are rich in natural resources here in America if we don't allow the left and the UN and the globalists to shut that down, to make us dependent, to tell us that we can't use it. That is why they are absolutely flipping out about Donald Trump. Because you want to talk about hoax? Talk about global warming, man-made global warming. That is the ultimate hoax. Mm. That is one of the key devices that they want to use to establish global governance. Because you have to have some way to pay for global governance. So you have to have an international crisis that takes a global government to solve. And then you have to be able to turn over money to that global government with a universal carbon tax or with redistrib redistribution of wealth with um, uh, these carbon credits. All of these are, are techniques that will need to be there for them to have a global government. They mm -hmm. have to have the money in order to uh, really have that power. Well, let's not forget, I mean, they're not only... Not disallowing us from using it, but they're also selling off our resources to foreign governments. Yes, yes, exactly. Double whammy there. And, and we should remember that it was the CIA, as well as people like George Bush and others, who sold us this idea a couple of decades ago that we had hit peak oil. And that's an idea that has <laughs> been around with us a very long time. As a matter of fact, you know, if you go back and you look at the history, I read a book one time about uh, the rise of John D. Rockefeller, okay? And it was during the Civil War, he decided, he was in Pennsylvania, he decided that he was not going to be drafted, he wasn't going to join and fight the war, he was going to make a fortune, because they had used uh, turpentine in the South to uh, light their homes, they, they, they burned uh, things in the home, they didn't have electricity, of course, and uh, the, the supply of turpentine was cut off, but they did have this messy stuff in Pennsylvania called crude oil, <laughs> and they realized that they could refine that and use that as a substitution for turpentine, so... Rockefeller bought his way out of being uh, drafted into the military, and he quickly cornered the refinery market in Pennsylvania, and he thought he had the world's supply of oil. At that time, they didn't know that it, w it was just kind of bubbling out of the cr uh, ground, you know, like the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on the ground comes this bubbling crude. Okay, well, he, he was a Pennsylvania uh, hillbilly uh, billionaire. 
Hey, they, yeah, they, they thought that they had all the oil in the world there in Pennsylvania. And he cornered that market. And the only thing that stopped that was the discovery of oil in Texas. And so then he quickly moved his refinery business into Ohio to try to take advantage of the Texas and the Pennsylvania oil fields. Thought he had everything cornered at that point. Then they found it in the Middle East. It's like, darn, you know, every time I, <laughs> every time I think I got a monopoly on this, they find it somewhere else. Mm. And then he was joined in all this. If you go back and you look at Wikipedia, they just had a few things there. 1919, David White, chief geologist of the U.S. Geological Survey, said peak production of oil will be passed possibly within three years. He said that in 1919. Then you go forward to 1953. Eugene Ayers, researcher for Gulf Oil, projected the U.S. ultimate recoverable oil resources were 100 billion barrels. Then production of the U.S. would peak no later than 1960. Then Newsweek in 1979. This very issue right here, the energy crisis. We're running out of oil. I mean, there's even a great tune. I always love uh, Tower Power, one of my favorite bands. I love the music, love the tune, but they had this, this song, There's Only So Much Oil in the Ground. Uh, and uh, no, that's not true. They were believing the mainstream media's fake news, their hoax news, that was put out by the experts. See, they always argue from a position of expert. You should believe them when they tell you that, the, that we're going to have one degree of warming and the, er, the world is going to melt down. Here, these people were telling us in 8.7 years, we're going to be out of crude oil. In 10.7 years, in 1979... 10.7 years from 1979, we were going to be out of natural gas. But, of course, even then, they were telling us we have 666.5 years left of coal. <laughs> so coal is pretty much an infinite supply, and we have ways that we can burn that cleanly. That's the key. And, of course, it wasn't just time. It was also Newsweek talking about the energy mess. Take a look at this. Uh, guys, get a shot of this cover here. I saved these things. When I saw these, I told my wife. She was the one who had the... Uh, uh, subscription to these magazines and I, I i didn't really read general magazines like this i always preferred to get uh left magazines or right magazines and i said uh, i want to keep these because this is going to be priceless and i think it is priceless i think this is more valuable than the fake hillary clinton uh edition but of course here they're talking about the massive rise in price and that's the point of the peak oil mm -hmm. is to make sure that they hold people hostage, that they blackmail us, that they get us involved in wars in the Middle East, mm -hmm. that they control this just like De Beers controls the diamond uh, exchange. They have a monopoly on that. These people who are selling us peak oil wanted to keep that. And think about where these CIA guys go. What did George Bush, the guy from the Northeast, the, uh, the Harvard uh, skull and bones guy, what did he do uh, as, as he, uh, you know, with his CIA connections? Well, he set up Zapata Oil which was involved in the um, uh, Bay of Pigs fiasco. You know, there's a couple of boats. Uh, they were named, one of them was named Zapata Oil. The other one was named Barbara. But, of course, George Bush would tell you he was never involved with the CIA before they appointed him as the head of the CIA. Well, if you believe that, uh, I've, got, um, <laughs> I've got a Newsweek magazine I could sell you. Yeah. But it was also, we see the same thing happening with uh, Dewhurst, who became lieutenant governor here in Texas, who single-handedly, shut down the move that we had against the TSA. This is a guy who left the CIA after a couple of decades, then spends the most money that anybody has ever spent to become lieutenant governor. Why? Because he made a fortune in the oil business. So that's the way they make these. They're made men, okay? These gangsters, this dark state that is underneath us. And we need to understand who these guys are because this is part of this color revolution. It isn't just George Soros. It's people on the right you know, we had an article from Kurt Nemo three years ago talking about John McCain and the CIA and how they were involved with the color revolutions and the dark state. And they are a, as much a part of it as George Soros and the mm -hmm. Democrats. And these are the mechanisms that they use in this. And so we see now also other articles that are on the Drudge Report today. Real news. Saudi Arabia is warning Trump not to block oil imports. Well, we don't need to block your oil imports. We got our own oil, Saudi. <laughs> <laughs> and and they have been intricately linked in. They've been put in the position with uh, uh, Richard Nixon, put them in the position of controlling the petrodollar as he took us off of the gold standard. He made Saudi Arabia the people who underwrote our currency. And we have been interlinked with them as well as with the CIA. So this is the way that they have tried to control us. And uh, they think they've got an agreement where they're going to be able to uh, cut down their production and raise the price of oil. Guess what? ain't going to happen because we're going to start using American domestic oil. That's one of the things Donald Trump said he's going to do, and I can't wait to see that happen, Leanne. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just very interesting to see how 
Uh, we have this fascist state-run media has been going on for decades trying to convince people of, of a certain reality they want to put forward. And now it's finally, uh, the tables have finally turned. People aren't believing this mess anymore. Mm -hmm. Perhaps now because we have documented history, we can go back now and look and see how ridiculous this is. And that's the good thing about the was. internet. Most people don't hang on to, to trashy magazines like this for 40 years. Right. I do. <laughs> right. But most people don't. You know, you read, read this stuff and you throw it out. But the internet remembers. Mm -hmm. And so they want to change that, don't they? Exactly. They want to be able to flush it down the memory hole like 1984. Well, and that, that was kind of the thing that kept hitting Hillary Clinton. We're thinking, does she not realize that we have the internet at our disposal where we can go back and get these videos of her where she's totally contradicting herself or, or really any of them? Um, you know, and that's what, with this whole WikiLeaks thing, uh, I think it's just a great warning to anyone in the future. Hey, just don't do dirty stuff because at some point all of your emails could be put on display. Um, but I think it's just really scary how we are entering a time where President Obama is actually calling for a truthiness filter, if that's not <laughs> Orwellian enough for you. Uh, <laughs> but we have this fascist state run media and we're going to call them the alt left because you know just turn it against them use their own tactics tactics against them but they're deciding what is fake and it's anything that's in competition with them how frightening is that and these are the people these it's the labels too it's just like we were talking about uh, you know the fact that they're coming up with uh, fake news and hoax news mm -hmm. because the uh, the pejorative label of conspiracy theorist uh, isn't doing it for them anymore because mm -hmm. people realize that those <laughs> the of us CIA been, created that term. Yeah, CIA, <laughs> another creation of the CIA, just yeah. like peak oil. They realize that those of us who've been labeled as conspiracy theorists are the ones who are doing the research and we're doing the analysis. We're telling you why we believe uh, what is behind these stories, why we challenge the official narrative, and that's that's not working for them. So they come up with that alt right is another example of that, right? Because they weren't winning against liberty against uh, a libertarian as, as a label. Mm -hmm. So they came up with uh, something called alt-right. And, and I, quite frankly, am not really sure what that label means. I've seen that used with a wide yeah. variety of people, but it's being used in a pejorative term. It's become a pejorative term, just like conspiracy theorists. Right. I don't acknowledge that. I've never considered myself to be right uh, or left, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I reject that false dichotomy. If you want a real right. political map, take a look at the Nolan chart. It was done by David Nolan, one of the founders of the Libertarian Party. It's actually a two-dimensional chart. Uh, you guys uh, look it up and pull it up on the screen and show people. But what you'll see there is uh, it's a two-dimensional chart. So you'll see if you map people's uh, positions out on terms of economic freedom and personal freedom, you'll see people on the left, you'll see people on the right, you'll see people in the center, but you'll also see libertarians at the top, authoritarians at the bottom. In other words, people who don't want any personal or economic freedom. That's a much more accurate uh, mapping of the political spectrum. Left and right is not accurate. So I, I refuse to buy into that false paradigm. There you go, right there. Uh, libertarian at the top, uh, status at the bottom, or authoritarian at the bottom, left and right, and centrist. So that's a much better way to analyze people's positions on things. But they want to they wanna label people as right. And the other part of it, Leanne, is the alt part. OK, right. you're, you're not really genuine. You're not part of the establishment. You're not authentic or important. You're just alternative. Well, it's not a wonder that so many people are so confused out there and just frustrated because they are being fed doublespeak. So they're saying Donald Trump is going to kill the First Amendment. He's going to be terrible for the freedom of press when they have been systematically destroying it more than a year and a half now, but we see it also coming out of uh, colleges. This was an article out of the LA Times, but also the Business Insider and others have talked about it. This is a professor of communications who <laughs> has started this master list of all of the uh, fake news that you want to keep out of the news feed. If that's not scary enough for you. So now we have this fascism being taught right to students, but yet they're, they're calling Trump and his supporters fascists as they're beating you. Yeah. Like beating, bludgeoning you so that you understand that you're the fascist. Oh, they hate free speech. <laughs> they hate free speech. Well, so we have, They you don't know, want a dialogue. They don't want a debate. They just, as we've seen over and over again, we talked about it earlier in the show. They just want to stand there and scream racist, racist, racist. Which no is what argument. we saw Glenn Beck do. Glenn Beck right. is saying uh, Breitbart is racist. They're white nationalists. It's like, they're not white nationalists. Well, it's interesting because, you know, you have Breitbart on this list, uh, the Zero Hedge. 
uh, a, you know, a lot of different. It's mostly conservative uh, websites that are here on this are we fake on there? news. Of course. Oh, good. Yeah. Of course yeah. we are. <laughs> uh, but the, that's a badge of honor. But interestingly, the blaze is not on there. Oh yeah, no. You know, well, let me uh, tell you what <laughs> they know that they can count on Glenn Beck. And if you ever had any doubts, you look at the way that he reacted to the situation with the Bundy Ranch, the lies that he told about people uh, trying to set them up as sovereign citizens, and and Clive and Bundy had no idea what a sovereign citizen was. Uh, he didn't understand that was a loaded term that was used by law enforcement, by the feds, by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And when they did that, that, that was what Glenn Beck did in the wake of the Bundy Ranch standoff was weaponized propaganda. And he lost a lot of his support there. But he's lost the rest of it yeah. in this election with Donald Trump as he refused to uh, uh, leave the never Trump camp and embrace Hillary Clinton. I mean, this <laughs> yeah. guy literally well, embraced he sees he's Clinton. losing all of his audience on one yeah. side. So now he's like groveling his way back. Well, he's uh, not going to get back with back Fox News, even though they're turning to the left. So he's trying to get in with CNN or MSNBC, probably as well, his media empire collapses. It, and let's not forget that it was when Facebook was exposed as filtering their algorithms and uh, deciding what would be trending in their trending top topics and how it was totally biased against conservative news sites. They invited all of these people in to have right. this open forum. Oh, he loved and he was there. And at, uh, yeah. and kissed his butt. Or as I call him, sucker bug, because yeah. <laughs> he bugs the suckers that go to Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, so the, I mean, let's just remind everyone. So not only did last week, the New York Times, or, or I guess this was this week, they put out the story, Globalism is a far-right conspiracy theory buoyed by Trump. So globalism is a conspiracy theory. But this is also CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, New York Times, all of these outlets that told us about weapons of mass destruction and took us to war and millions of people died as yeah. a result of that fake news. So well, it was a it's, conspiracy it's theory, and it wasn't a conspiracy theory. It was a thing that we were all, that was a good thing for us, and we should embrace it, even though it's been harming us. No, no, no. In the long term, it's, it's good for us. So, you know, they sold it to us for a few months this summer as a good thing that we wanted to have. And now that they've lost, they've gone back to it being a conspiracy theory. again. Right. I mean, they just cannot stand the fact that they had all global forces in alignment of the establishment, uh, media, celebrities, the Bushes, the, rolling out the Obamas. The, we beat the them thing. all. We beat them all. And they can't stand it. Here's one of the things that distinguishes a true hoax, fake, lying news site with other people. It's one thing to have a, uh, a news site that argues from a particular point of view and is upfront about it. Mm -hmm. It's quite another thing to come out and say, I'm objective, I'm not biased, I'm, I have no agenda here. And we have seen through these leaks that came out from uh, Julian Assange and uh, WikiLeaks and others, we have seen the machinations behind the scene. We have seen uh, uh, the, these people working together with Hillary Clinton, working with the DNC, sending out the questions that are going to be asked at the debates, at the town halls, uh, conspiring with them as to how they can promote their agenda, their candidate. And that's the dishonesty behind this, to say, uh, I, I have no agenda here. Right. I am, I'm completely objective and I'm biased, and yet they're doing this behind the scenes. That's true fake news. That's true hoaxes okay just right. as we've seen them you know call call uh, this a conspiracy theory globalism and then say no it's real and it's good and now it's back to con that's the fakeness behind this right it is absolute madness and now they're combining it all to just stir massive confusion uh tearing down the first amendment but the fact is truth resonates and that's right. why we were able to take over this election and spread like wildfire because the truth resonates and they're they're not based in fact there with their arguments. David Knight with Leanne McAdoo will be right back after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Leanne McAdoo. We have one more segment in the regular show. And then in the fourth hour, we have Roger Stone is going to be joining us. And Leanne will be here with Roger. Of course, uh, Leanne will be with me in the uh, segment coming up at the top of the hour. Uh, to, we're going to finish up the news here in just a moment. What we're talking about with the... Um, uh, the fake news and, and Leanne had an interesting uh, parallel uh, that she wanted to uh, to talk about with this. But real quickly, I just wanted to point out we have a couple of new products. We have InfoWars Prime app, which is a new application. I've mentioned this uh, earlier in the show. You can get exclusive videos directly from me, from Leanne, from Owen, from Alex Jones, all the reporters. Uh, you'll see that behind the scenes action, uh, live video feeds. Each of us will have our own separate channel. That's always been one of the problems with uh, YouTube. We do so many videos a day, they all get dumped in the hopper. Uh, here you can follow uh, individuals uh, on this uh, new app as well as get exclusive offers that you'll only see 
at the InfoWars Prime app. Take a look at the Apple and the Android stores to uh, see about downloading that. It is on a subscription basis. Right now, you can get it at half price, uh, half price as an introductory offer. Also, as an introductory offer, we have a new product at InfoWars Life, BioPCA. BioPCA is specifically formulated to help give your hair, skin, and nails a healthy appearance and to fight back against our toxic environment. Not just the things that you eat and drink that have toxins in them, uh, you know, like the tap water that they put fluoride in, you know, all that type of thing. But also the soap and the shampoo that you put on your hair that's got a lot of toxic chemicals in it if you're not careful. But regardless, even if you don't use unhealthy shampoos and soaps, this still gives you the nutrients that your body needs to build healthy skin, hair, and nails. It has biotin, zinc, and a proprietary blend of enzymes and collagens. Again, it's an introductory offer. It won't last very long. And finally, we have a loss leader special, only $9.95. For our Trump is my president shirt. Get them while they last. They're not going to last very long at that price. Trump is my president. You can tell that to people and you can shout it on your red shirt right there. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't, uh, couldn't wear that to the uh, election booth, but now the election is over and he is uh, president elect. That's a great uh, commemorative shirt. All right, loud and proud. Leanne, you had an interesting uh, point yeah. about fake news and a parallel to the uh, Nazi bakers that became part of the debate and the Libertarian Party with. Uh, yeah, Harry well, we're just others. like you know we're watching this fascist takeover while they're pointing their fingers, calling everyone else fascist and racist and uh, hateful and intolerant. So Twitter has already initiated a massive purge of prominent alt right accounts. So these are. Uh, accounts that they deem to be all right. They're already, you know, shadow banning a lot of people. And so many people are celebrating this saying, yeah, this is their, their company. They don't have to give you a platform to spew your hate speech. This is, but then let's just a year or so ago, a couple years when they were saying that that bakery had to bake the cake for the gay couple. It forced yeah. them or, and shut them down, shut them down Small business. So Said you're open and you have a public business. So you don't get to make that determination. What about the, that's a great point, yeah, Leanne. What about, what about these public media organizations, social media organizations, that are they get to choose a, to shut that down? They're basically becoming a public, public utility at this point. So mm -hmm. now they get to decide mm -hmm. who gets to have access. I mean, a lot of people make their uh, money with and social that was, media. That was brought up uh, by Gary Johnson, who uh, was asked by in, in a debate by one of the other candidates in the Libertarian Party. So would you compel... A, a Jewish bakery to bake a cake for an, a, to make a Nazi cake. And he said, Oh, yes, absolutely, I would. And using that same argument. And I absolutely totally disagreed with him. I think it is Twitter and Facebook's right if they want to censor people. But we need to understand uh, that people are going to censor them. They're right. going to boycott those organizations, just like people would boycott uh, a bakery that, that wouldn't, uh, uh, that they didn't like. But I don't think we should hold a gun to people's heads and force them to do that. But that is essentially the parallel. How are yeah. you going to shut down a bakery that doesn't want to do well, a, a gay wedding cake well, and then allow them to do this? Especially when your freedom of religion, of course, is protected there by the Bill of Rights. But mm -hmm. also, too, the, the uh, politician who forced that bakery to pay, um, he didn't get reelected. So there you uh, go. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. And this affects far more people. And it also is a contradiction of the First Amendment. They don't have a problem with the <laughs> contradicting the First Amendment. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Leanne McAdoo. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Leanne McAdoo. In the next segment, we're going to have Roger Stone is going to be joining us. And I'll be leaving. Leanne will be here with uh, Roger Stone. But I think it was a great point that you brought up just before we went to break, Leanne. And we didn't have enough time really to talk about it. It, it affects people so much more to have major social media outlets like Facebook and Twitter and even Google deciding that they're going to censor this or that. And, of right. course, they're saying, well, it's our, our uh, freedom as a, um, a, as a um, you know, private company to decide what we want on our site. And yet they have used that opposite argument to put small, small business, bakers yeah. out of business who objected to doing a particular thing because it violated their free exercise of their religion, which is protected. So now we have the opposite going around. We have these big mega corporations. Of course, they can do whatever they want. That's the double standard that we always see. Mm -hmm. Coming in and saying, no, I can shut down freedom of speech because I have private property rights. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's just a total double standard. You have YouTube and uh, Facebook and Google saying, well, you know, we're going to cut off the advertising income for your channel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have anything that we determine to be uh, something we don't like with the language or if you're talking about politics, we're just going to cut off the income stream for you. You know, and that's I mean, that's powerful. A lot of people are making their living 
mm-hmm. via social media. And then if you just cut them down, cut them off entirely, I mean, that's that's very powerful. So this is a total double standard that needs to be addressed. I think uh, the other part of this, though, too, is we look at this, these Twitter accounts and, and you know, they we, we got Glenn Beck out there saying that Breitbart is a white nationalist organization because what he's doing is he's conflating all these different things together with the alt-right. This really was a white nationalist organization that they shut down on Twitter. And again, we're back to the, you know, can you uh, force somebody to a Jewish bakery to bake a Nazi cake? Well, Gary Johnson said yes. Uh, I disagreed. But he said yes. But now these same people reverse this. But I think it it points out it's very dangerous for us to buy into these language terms that they use. Mm -hmm. They always pick the terms so that they have the linguistic high ground. Right. And they make us look bad by the terms that they use. And we should stop buying into this alt-right label, I think. I think we need to identify ourselves as libertarians because that identifies the fact that our concern is individual liberty. And we don't really care what uh, skin color you are, what your gender is or whatever. We're about individual liberty. That's what I'm about. And uh, as I said before, paleo libertarian, we won't go into the uh, d- the differences between libertarian and paleo. But, you know, that's kind of more conservative uh, point of view on some social issues, a paleo libertarian But we need to stand with things that are clearly defined in the public eye Mm -hmm. that have a positive connotation because they know that we're about liberty. We've finally uh, hammered that down, that it's about liberty. And when you say alt-right and you have these other organizations that truly are Nazi organizations or Ku Klux Klan organizations or uh, white nationalist organizations, and they self-identify themselves as alt-right, and nobody really knows what that definition is, if we use that same thing or we allow other yeah. people to label us that way, then you've got people like Glenn Beck coming in and saying, look, they're all the same. They're all the, the, you know, these people over here. They're uh, right. white nationalists as well. And they're Nazis as well. Right. Well, and I do agree with you on that. And I've, I've been outspoken about saying that I, I disagree with being labeled as that. Um, but however, we also know that they say, well, when they go low, we go high. But behind <laughs> the scenes, they go even lower. That's right, and yeah. so. <laughs> to fight them at their own battle, we really do need to use their own tactics against them. That's why I say let's just start calling them the alt-left fascist state-run <laughs> media. And, you know, they are using their rules for radicals. They're they're using the playbook, but then they're going to make you play it. You know, would Jesus, what would Jesus do? That's not very Christian-like of you to call me an alt-left fascist. My goodness. Yeah, they, they try <laughs> to make us, uh, uh, you know, play play by our own rule book. You know right. what? I, I would like to play make- by our own, own rule book. One of the things that I don't like uh, by some people who self-label themselves as alt-right is not just the racism and the white nationalism, but also the tactics of, of screaming and shouting at people. I, I think that we need to respect people as individuals. We can have a rational argument without being deliberately provocative, uh, deliberately hateful. We don't want to adopt those tactics of the alt-left. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Leanne McAdoo. I'm going to be switching out, and Leanne is going to be here with our host for the fourth hour, Roger Stone of Stone Cold Truth. No stranger to uh, the InfoWars uh, broadcast. Of course, he was Trump's first campaign manager. He's still an advisor. Uh, and we want to see what he has to say one week later after the election. Of course, Roger was also involved with Stop the Steal, monitoring the election. And I, I think it's fascinating, uh, Roger, as you're standing there, as you're sitting there uh, uh, in front of all of the memorabilia that you've got from all the past campaigns that you've been in. You know, it's interesting you had to Stop the Steal because you knew there was going to be a lot of hanky-panky uh, in this election, and uh, we saw that in spades in North Carolina, one particular county, Durham County, heavily Democratic. Uh, they brought in about uh, 90 some odd thousand votes at midnight, and now that has thrown, didn't turn it over to Trump because Trump had a, a massive uh, uh, landslide, I believe, that they, they tried to, uh, to uh, edge that out. But they did affect the gubernatorial race there. And so now we've got a situation there that looks like they're not going to be able to decide that race until Thanksgiving. It is so close that it'll probably be a recount. And both sides, uh, both the Democrats and Republicans, uh, the NAACP, other leftist groups are are really angry at the city of Durham, the county of Durham, uh, for how they rigged this election. They kept the polls open for another 90 minutes. (laughs) So that's an example of what you knew was going to be happening. And if we had had a close election with Donald Trump, we would be seeing this happening nationwide, wouldn't we, Roger? Absolutely, uh, David. First of all, I want to say thank you to uh, InfoWars.com and Alex Jones for letting me sit in today. 
uh, you really are the tip of the spear. I think people don't understand uh, in the mainstream media the millions and millions of foot soldiers that Infowars.com uh, empowered uh, and inspired and mobilized uh, in the Trump revolution. So here we are eight days in, and as we look back on it, you're exactly right. The good news here is the tsunami was so large that they couldn't steal it. Although, make no mistake about it, they had uh, extensive plans to do so. As you know, uh, David Boyce uh, at Boyce Schiller, the same lawyer who headed the Gore 2000 recount, went to the U.S. Supreme Court in an attempt to stop us from uh, exit polling uh, in order to be able to check on the honesty and the integrity of the election. Uh, fortunately, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against him, so the current score is Stone 2, Boyce 0, uh, <laughs> I'm, happy, I'm happy to say. That's great. And, of course, that's a key way that they want to steal it. They want to make sure there's no exit polls. Here in Texas, they want to take the electronic voting machines and shut down any uh, ability to track these ballots after the fact. So we're, we're on to their games. And you have done a, a magnificent job of educating the American public. And I think, really, at this point... We need to, from the position of the winner, so they can't say this is simply sour grapes, we need to push forward with real election reform. But I know you've got your, your own uh, subjects there that you want to talk about. I'm going to check out and turn this over to, uh, to you, Roger, and to uh, Leanne McAdoo. Thank you. Many thanks, David. Now, you were uh, a leading candidate for the Stone Cold Truth Best and Worst Dress List, which will come out on <laughs> New Year's Day. Uh, as it has for 10 years, and you may know the background on this, uh, Mr. Blackwell, who was a very famous Hollywood-based columnist designer, would put out a list every New Year's Day uh, of the best and worst dressed celebrities, athletes, movie stars, socialites, and so on. Uh, he passed away some 12 years ago, I think. We have revived this tradition. Uh, it, it is done, again, every New Year's Day. Now, I'm going to warn you, David, you're a contender, <laughs> and but both if I categories? see you on the air without a necktie again, you could drop right off the list. Well, I, I, you could put me in in both categories. I'd probably end up in the top five no, as no, both no, best and no, worst no, you, dress. So. No, not at all. You are you are an excellent dresser, and, you know, look, well, thank you. feel good, Shop look good. Yeah. <laughs> thank yes. you. Thank you. Back to you, so, Roger. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out and turn this over to you and Leanne. Thank you. Great. Many thanks. So uh, we are eight days into the uh, Trump revolution. Uh, it's given us a chance to sit back and look at the numbers uh, and figure out how, how all of this happened. As you know, the mainstream media had Donald Trump dead and buried. It was over. Hillary was picking her cabinet. She had scheduled her fireworks uh, for New York. Um, the uh, clique around her was beginning to plan how they were going to take away our guns, how they were going to abridge our civil liberties, and most importantly, how they were going to crack down on the alternative media. Even today, we see Facebook uh, and uh, Google uh, deciding that they are going to begin limiting what they call fake news. Well, what is fake news? This is a slippery slope, in my opinion. Uh, at some point, uh, is, uh, is Infowars.com fake news? Is Breitbart fake news? Is Town Hall fake news? Is Daily Caller fake news? I think this is the rubric uh, that they were planning to use to silence our voices. That would leave the mainstream media with a monopoly on information, as they had before, when only ABC, CBS, and NBC um, held forth and really did control the national narrative. If it didn't happen on one of those three networks and then later CNN and Fox, well, then it didn't happen at all. So I think that has been averted. As I look back on the election, I see one pivotal decision that I think made all the difference. Uh, and that was that in the closing days uh, of the election, uh, the Trump campaign made a strategic judgment to expand the map. They made a foray into Michigan and Wisconsin that would turn out to be pivotal, that would actually win this election for Donald Trump. Now, I noticed that Hillary did not campaign in those states. I noticed that polls I was watching, both private polls and public polls, showed that Trump was on the move in both places. 
And, of course, the rest is history. He dropped in in both places, barnstorming. In the case of Michigan, with only a few hours' notice, 35,000 people turned out to greet him. Uh, and I think that he dominated state media in both of those states for the close. Uh, if there's any one decision that I would point to, it would be this one. And I think the credit goes to Steve Bannon, uh, who is under fire today, we'll talk about that a little later, um, for uh, really the most important decision in terms of turning this election. So if I had to uh, point at any one item, that would be it. Studying it as a student of American politics, someone who's been involved in nine presidential campaigns, proud to say I worked for three Republican presidents, you could see the trend line. Trump was gaining steadily the last two weeks. In the beginning, Hillary was sitting still, and it was clear that he would pass her. Then she began to drop. The uh, announcement of the 680,000 emails that were on the Abedin Wiener server, emails that FBI Director Comey is lying about, this is the treasure trove of criminality, including treason, pay for play, corruption, sexual exploitation. Um, we're not finished by a long shot with this story, but that revelation only accelerated Trump's climb. And he crossed the line, essentially passed her at exactly the right time. Now, former President Nixon, a mentor of mine, somebody I learned a great deal from, believed very strongly that you had to bring your campaign to a peak at exactly the right time. So uh, I think Trump did that. I think you cannot understate the key role that Infowars.com played in that victory. I understand the New York Times is working on a profile on Alex Jones, should be posted any moment now, which I think recognizes the incredible role that was played here. So if congratulations are in order, if anybody is to be declared an MVP, it has to be among them, Alex Jones and the crew here at Infowars.com. <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate that. I, I know we've been hearing that a lot, Roger, and thank you so much. It's just so incredible how uh, this full-on onslaught to actually have the president come out and say uh, that we need a truthiness filter and to wax poetic for the days when there was only three media outlets that were giving people access to the news when they had control over the propaganda channels and and how they're really trying to move back in that direction. But then their slogan is, oh, we're moving forward, not backward. And <laughs> they've got other little fascist protesters out there saying, we're, we're not going to go backward. Yeah, we want to go with our state run propaganda media. It's just it's incredible. I mean, what do you see? I know we've got about a minute and a half left here, but going forward, are they going to uphold the separation of powers and, and, and check power rather than elect power? Well, look, I think these uh, demonstrations are, uh, they're a false flag. This is a MacGuffin. Uh, these are fraudulent, meaning they are paid for by George Soros and his allies. They're hunkered down in Washington, even as we speak, licking their wounds. They spent at least $500 million on these various phony outside groups. I myself was a victim of Media Matters uh, for America, which is a front group run by the criminal David Brock, who was money laundering. Uh, there's an extensive complaint at the Federal Election Commission. Trust me, if we on the right did what Brock did, we'd be in handcuffs right now in terms of mixing hard dollars and soft dollars. So uh, I don't think that these demonstrations are sustainable. We know, for example, in the Portland demonstration, most of the people who showed up didn't even vote. In my hometown of Fort Lauderdale, there were flyers saying that Donald Trump was going to nullify gay marriages. That's the kind of disinformation that we're fighting. Right. When he has been outspoken uh, saying, you know, he was congratulating Elton John on his marriage, you know, many years ago when Hillary Clinton and Obama were both openly opposing gay marriage. So, I mean, it's just total misinformation out there. Thank you, Roger. Stay right back. Uh, stick around, guys. We'll be right back with Roger Stone.
And welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. This is the fourth hour overdrive. I am Leanne McAdoo, and your host for the hour is Roger Stone of StoneColdTruth.com. Now, before the break, we were talking about uh, just relishing in witnessing the death spiral of the old media and, of course, the victory being celebrated right now by the new media and, you know, frankly, Americans, whether you are aware of it or not, give Donald Trump a chance. Roger? Well, first of all, um, anybody who's watched me here knows that I'm a great believer in some of the Infowars.com products. Frankly, without brain force, I don't think I could have kept up the pace necessary to help Donald Trump win this election. Two weeks out, I felt a cold coming on. I went to Silver Bullet, your colloidal uh, formula, knocked my coal out like that, and I was right back on the rampart. So the revolution isn't free, folks. I, I strongly recommend a couple products here. Most importantly, and I think the one that's the most fun, is the uh, InfoWars Trump is my president shirt. Now, you're going to want to wear this shirt on Inauguration Day. You're going to want to wear this shirt to let your friends and neighbors know that you were a foot soldier in the Trump revolution. Uh, this is going to end up in the Smithsonian, folks. So get yours now. Uh, they're not going to be around forever. This is a piece of history. Uh, you're going to want to pass this shirt down to your children and your grandchildren because you were in on the saving of America. Now, uh, the these shirts are available at nine ninety five. This was uh, came out of the uh, the brain uh, of uh, Alex Jones and uh, my friend Joe Biggs and the friends at Infowars. And uh, grab yours now because these really won't be around forever. The other product I really like is the, uh, my wife particularly likes, is the Bio PCA, which is the ultimate formula for hair, skin, and nails put together by InfoWars Light. Now, as much as we might hate it, the toxic chemicals in our food and in our environment, they are playing havoc with your skin, with your hair, and now you can fight back. This product, Bio PCA, was specifically formulated by the InfoWars team of chemists and scientists to give your hair, your skin, your nails a healthy appearance and to fight back against this toxic environment. So, folks, grab these products. When you do so, you're helping fund the revolution. You are helping fund the uh, the uh, clarion call of Infowars.com to get the message out to liberty-minded patriots, to Trump supporters, to independents, to, to wayward Democrats who are coming our way. It is invaluable for uh for the revolution to go forward but we cannot run on empty these products are first rate i use them myself i can't go on and on about how great they are we are in a situation here where the transition is afoot this is kind of like game of thrones you've got the mike pence faction the right running mate a guy who did an unbelievable job for president-elect trump you have uh senator jeff sessions uh, another patriot was actually my candidate for vice president, now rumored to be uh, the next attorney general of the United States. Uh, you have uh, the Trump campaign veterans who are committed to being sure that those who supported Trump are represented in this government. As I have said here on Infowars.com and also at StoneColdTruth.com, the greatest danger now is the establishment boarding party. The neocons who show up out of nowhere after leaving their never Trump headquarters and saying, well, I was with you the whole time and I want to be assistant secretary of state or secretary of the treasury or whatever. This is uh, this is uh, vital for people to understand. Now, Mike Pence has restructured the entire transition, the K Street crowd that appears to have been brought in by Governor Chris Christie um, has been uh, has been uh, debenched. They are gone. The transition is undergoing uh, a complete restructuring to make sure that those who support the Trump agenda end up in this government. Leanne, questions? Well, I think I would love to get more on that after the break with the, the fact that they're freaking out. Oh, they're calling it the purge that all the lobbyists have been cut from Trump's transition team. And like you point out, the never Trumpers kind of crawl out from their hole. Donald Trump is, is very outspoken. One of the main things that he appreciates is loyalty. He 
he has not minced words when it comes to that. And I think that that's something a lot of people need to understand is that that, that matters to him. So he made that very clear <laughs> from the get go. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many lobbyists in their Gucci shoes have jumped off the 14th Street Bridge, but <laughs> it's a high number. There is panic in the city. Oh, my God. We have a president who can't be bought and can't be bullied. Mm. We have a president that nobody owns. It's music to my ears. I'm headed to Washington next week. I can't wait. Well, we'll be right back with more from Roger Stone. Well, you are now entering overdrive of the Alex Jones Show. I am Leanne McAdoo, and your host for the remainder of the hour is Roger Stone of StoneColdTruth.com. Now, Roger, before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, Trump's transition team and just looking at how the media is in a frenzy, saying there's reports of turmoil on the transition. It's it's eight days. I mean, typically, you're you're going to see the uh, these staff picks taking about five weeks. I mean. Take some time, get to kind of the ins and outs here. But uh, what is a president-elect and, and future president Trump going to be doing to fight a press that's already positioning themselves to be non-friendly? Well, Leanne, I think your analysis is exactly right. I was a member of President Ronald Reagan's transition, not once, but twice. Uh, so I have seen this movie. Uh, and uh, there are an enormous number of federal positions that must be filled, but I think they are wise to take their time to sort out the best qualified people, but most importantly, those who are not globalists, those who are not neocons. I mean, we didn't defeat Jeb Bush so that we could empower his lackeys. Uh, that wasn't the point of this election. And now you have uh, two things going on in Washington, I think, that are very important. One is the unprecedented personal attack on Steve Bannon. Now, uh, in full disclosure, I write for Breitbart, and I intend, you to, intend to continue writing for them. I think Steve Bannon is a freedom fighter. I think uh, that he can think outside the box. He understands the new media. He uh, particularly understands who Donald Trump's enemies are. He understands the globalist threat. He understands the threat of the uh, of the neocons and those who would immerse us in war without reason. And he is particularly focused on the immigration issue and the fact that our current immigration policies have left our, our neighborhoods and our homes unsafe. Now, Bannon, who I have known for some time, is not an anti-Semite, has never been an anti-Semite. This is a canard. This is a fraud. Uh, why are they so desperate to unhorse Steve Bannon? Because he gets it. Because he knows who the bad guys are. And because the war he has waged at Breitbart is focused exactly at the mainstream media. Now, I'm glad to see we're starting to get some balance. I saw the National Jewish Coalition come forward and denounce these attacks as fraudulent. Uh, but it has to be tough to be Steve Bannon, to go home every night after they have dumped this load of garbage on you. Steve Bannon is not a hater, has never been a hater. He is the garter of the Trump flame, or I should say the guardian of the Trump flame. And that's why they want to get rid of him, because he's got their number, and he understands that the globalists, the Soros-funded globalists, they're not going to quit. They're not going to go away just because they uh, lost an election. So um, I uh, am particularly proud to call Steve Bannon my friend. I'm glad the president has put him in a place, uh, in an office that used to be peopled by uh, Karl Rove when he was the strategist for the president of the United States. Uh, and I am confident that Steve Bannon is going to keep the Trump administration focused on the Trump agenda. Well, he's obviously proven himself as a strategist. Uh, Mr. Bannon was able to get us a President Trump, despite the fact that the entire establishment, including the global establishment, the media, the entertainment industry, everyone, all cylinders were firing to take out Donald Trump. And he was able to combat that. I mean, that is a massive accomplishment. I was actually retweeting some articles from former Breitbart employees who were like, I can't believe I'm defending Steve Bannon right now, but he's nothing about what the media is saying. And, um, you know, I wanted to point out that, again, the left is using these Alinsky tactics, the rules for radicals. And this, of course, is number 13. Pick the target, freeze it 
personalize it and polarize it. So everything they were trying to do to take out Donald Trump, to destroy his brand, his family, they didn't care if they would destroy the man. Well, now they're taking that and turning it on to Mr. Bannon. Exactly right. Look, Steve Bannon um, uh, is not putting words in Donald Trump's mouth. No one puts words in Donald Trump's mouth. I've known Donald Trump for almost 40 years, 39 years to be exact. Uh, I think he has helped him shape his message. But the key instincts here on immigration, on trade, on our economy, on our completely incoherent yet expensive foreign policy... These are things Trump has been talking about for 30 years. In 1988, when he went to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to address the Portsmouth Chamber of Commerce, I look back at that speech. He talked about NATO and the fact that it was time for our allies to pay their fair share. He talked about the inequality of the our trade agreements, and this was pre-NAFTA. So uh, it is. Uh, there's an amazing consistency in Donald Trump. Those who think that uh, Bannon or before him Manafort or before him Roger Stone is somehow a ventriloquist, that anyone puts words in Donald Trump's mouth it is just not true. They hate Bannon because he is effective. They hate Bannon because he has helped lead this revolution. And the bad news for the Soros crowd is Steve Bannon isn't going anywhere. He's going to be right there uh, at Donald Trump's uh, right sleeve. Now, the other battle royal that I'm plugged into and he getting updates hourly is who is going to be the Secretary of State in the next administration. Uh, to my surprise, former Mayor Rudy Giuliani, uh, probably the most effective of the Trump surrogates, probably the most effective speech at the Republican National Convention, a guy that shows that he has the guts as Nixon would say, to grab the other guys by the hair and pull them down the cliff, uh, has made it clear that he is not interested in being attorney general, uh, but that he is interested in, uh, in fostering and guiding the Trump foreign policy, which in my view is a non-interventionist foreign policy as Secretary of State. John Bolton, uh, who served as the U.N. ambassador in an interim appointment under uh, George Bush, has made it clear that he is also interested in this job. Now, I know Bolton. I like Bolton. I played poker with Bolton. He's a terrific guy, but he's a neocon, uh, and I don't think his views reflect the president-elect's views, particularly not in the area of Russia, where I think he is more bellicose uh, than Trump is. The whole idea that Trump is was in the pocket of the Russians or that, um, or that uh, Stone or Manafort or, or Trump were on the payroll of the Russians. Uh, that's accusing us of treason, by the way. This was fraudulent. But Trump does favor a period of detente. He would like to go into hard-headed negotiations with Putin and see if we can coexist without thermonuclear war. Uh, and maybe we could actually team up to destroy ISIS. So Trump was, ironically, the peace candidate. I think this is why three out of ten Bernie Sanders supporters in the end voted for Trump. Now, the other uh, contender here, other than Bolton and Giuliani, uh, is Senator Corker from Tennessee. Uh, I think the greatest advocate of Senator Corker for this job is Senator Corker, although Rand Paul the quasi-libertarian, because I don't think he's the purist who his fa that his father is. And by the way, I'm an admirer of, Rand uh, of Ron Paul. Uh, voted for him. My last vote uh, as a Republican before I switched to the Libertarian Party was in the Florida Republican primary four years ago. I proudly voted for Ron Paul. Uh, but Rand Paul has let it be known that he will filibuster the appointment of a Giuliani or of a Bolton, and that he favors uh, the appointment of his colleague, Senator Corker. Uh, this is uh, what all of Washington is focused on. Uh, this is going to be uh, the great fight. I would think that Giuliani has the inside track, if for no other reason because of his longstanding personal relationship with the president-elect. They have known each other for some 30-odd years, 
back to Rudy's days as the U.S. attorney uh, for the district that includes Manhattan, where Donald Trump lives. Um, he hasn't known Bolton that long. Uh, they have a nice relationship. Bolton, to his credit, unlike many of the never Trumpers, once Donald was nominated, he put his back uh, to it. He supported the candidate. He made speeches on his behalf. So my hat's off to him in that regard. Uh, Corker, you may recall, showed up at Trump Tower shortly after Donald Trump wrapped up the nomination. There was widespread speculation that this meant we might be headed for a Trump Corker ticket. I later learned that it was Senator Corker who requested the meeting rather than uh, Donald Trump. Uh, reportedly, the two men got along well. It did fuel some stories back in Tennessee that Corker was a vice presidential contender when that was never really the case. Uh, in the meantime, you have had, therefore, this three-way competition that all of the folks inside the Beltway are focused on. The, uh, the Chris Christie imprimatur uh, at the transition is gone. Uh, he has been ousted largely over the George Washington Bridge allegations. To be clear, at least three witnesses told the federal court that Chris Christie personally knew about and laughed about the George Washington Bridge closing, which, of course, caused chaos in the small town of Fort Lee, the purpose of the bridge closing to punish a local mayor who refused to endorse Christie's reelection. When Christie went out the door, as I said earlier, so did the K Street lobbyists. It's a new day under the leadership of Mike Pence. There will be, uh, I think, a greater emphasis on loyalty to Trump and adherence to the Trump agenda. That is not to say that the Trump candidate uh, cabinet won't have any Democrats, because, Leanne, it will. I think this is going to be a cabinet that represents all the people. Uh, I know that there are several high-level Democrats uh, who are patriots, uh, but who are Democrats nonetheless, who are under consideration for this administration, giving it a bipartisan flavor. This is something President Nixon tried to do and failed. He offered the U.N. ambassadorship to Hubert Humphrey, declined. He offered a cabinet job uh, to, uh, to, uh, of defense secretary to uh, Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, a hardliner from Washington State. He also declined. So Trump may achieve what both Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan were unable to achieve by having a bipartisan cabinet. Are you hearing anything about uh, attorney general picks? I know a lot of people have been talking back and forth a lot on Twitter. So people are very curious. I, I still think Jeff Sessions, mm -hmm. uh, who is probably my favorite member of the U.S. Senate, uh, is the front runner for that job if he wants it. Uh, his uh, chief aide, uh, 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 a fellow named Dearborn, very able man, uh, a guy who really understands the Trump agenda, um, is playing a key role in the transition. Now, this New York Times piece we're showing now, I have no idea where most of this information came from. There's a lot of disinformation in there, a lot of people being mentioned for cabinet jobs who are really not under consideration. When I spoke to the president-elect last week, and we had a, a nice and cordial uh, conversation, uh, which I'm not going to really get into, other than to say, uh, I said to him, well, Mr. President, how how's the transition going? And he said, well, I guess they're over there making their lists. On the other hand, I'm going to have a list of my own. Uh, I'd be very surprised if Jeff Sessions is not on that list. Uh, I know of the high regard that, uh, that Donald Trump has for him. Uh, I also know that he had the courage to be for Trump when nobody else did. Uh, that that uh, his colleagues in the Senate thought, God, is this guy out of his mind? But he turned out, of course, to be a sage. So I would be very happy with Jeff Sessions as Attorney General. Wouldn't mind seeing him on the U.S. Supreme Court. Focus on this, though. I think President Donald Trump is going to have four, count them, four nominations for the U.S. Supreme Court. That's how important this election was. That is how we shape the future. That's why Trump's victory was all important.
Right. I think that really is going to be the key takeaway from this entire election. So important. And I, I forget where I was reading an article, but they were sort of saying, if you need any more proof that Trump wasn't expecting to win this at all, he he didn't prepare a speech, nor does he have his <laughs> staff picks. So there's this turmoil with it. To me, I think that that's very impressive because as we learned from WikiLeaks, uh, before President Obama was even elected, they were already saying, well, here's the list for the staff picks. They were basically, uh, his cabinet had already been filled before he was even elected. So to me, I'm quite impressed that we're actually well, going through this. The, the, the Trump operation has always had uh, an impromptu and spontaneous nature to it. His mm -hmm. campaign wasn't really a, a traditional presidential campaign. It was an uprising. It, it was an insurrection against the established order. It was very much a guerrilla function, a, a guerrilla oriented effort. Uh, but it more than made up in intensity what it lacked in structure. Trump supporters were true believers. Our voters were, couldn't wait for Election Day. They wanted to vote for Donald Trump and Mike Pence. Compare that to the job of the Clinton campaign, corralling voters who weren't even crazy about their candidate, uh, who were ambivalent. This was reflected in the fact that her crowd sizes were were ridiculous. Uh, and uh, the mainstream media went to great lengths to conceal the fact that she was having trouble raising a decent crowd in places where Trump was getting 20, 30, 40, 50,000 uh, people towards the end. It was really the Herculean effort of Donald Trump that I think uh, uh, made the difference, the barnstorming in those last two weeks. Uh, Leanne, I'm going to take this opportunity to remind people that the revolution is not free. Uh, and with the inauguration coming up, I really think you want to grab your Trump is my president t-shirt at, at the Infowars.com store. Now, this t-shirt you can buy right along the iconic Trump uh, pardon me, a uh, Clinton rape t-shirt. This is the t-shirt that Alex Jones used to break through the mainstream media uh, blockade. So you're going to want the Trump is my president t-shirt for inauguration day. You're going to want the iconic Bill Clinton rape t-shirt because as Time Magazine wrote, this is a part of Christi uh, of history. I know an advanced man who has worked for the Clintons, who's active in this campaign. I ran into him in a bar uh, in New York the other night, and he told me that these T-shirts and the rape whistle drove them crazy. So get to Infowars.com, <laughs> grab your shirts now before they are no more. <laughs> and I can't wait to auction off my Bill Clinton rape shirt that we actually uh, used to trigger the Young Turks. I still have it in my possession I might hold on to it for my little piece of history. Stick around. We will be right back with the end of the show with Roger Stone of StoneColdTruth.com. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I am Leanne McAdoo, joined by Roger Stone of StoneColdTruth.com. Now, before the break, we were talking about a lot of these potential staff picks. And, of course, uh, uh, Laura Ingram has actually talked a little bit about potentially being the press secretary and how cool that would be if called upon to serve her country in that capacity. To me, I think it's so spectacular that we're, we are witnessing the establishment press shaking in their boots and then daring to say, you know, that now all of a sudden they're concerned about the First Amendment now that they see they're irrelevant. <laughs> Congratulate I love, I yourself love, on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I love Laura Ingram. I think she would be terrific if the president-elect chooses to offer her that job. I, I would also... Frankly, look at Monica Crowley, uh, who has uh, been a Trump supporter from the beginning, uh, taking off her, her fox hat for a moment, an enormously able woman. Uh, they would both be a great credit uh, mm -hmm. to this administration. Uh, before we, uh, we move on here, I do want to uh, say again uh, that if you want to support the revolution, you need to go to the Infowars.com store where they've got some great products. Uh, Mrs. Stone reminds me again about bio pca which is her favorite now this has fourteen powerful ingredients uh... including biotin zinc which is all important to recharge your immune system uh... and this proprietary blend of enzymes and collagen is really good for your hair your nails your skin your general well-being uh, this is a product we have tried in the stone household along with 
uh, with Brain Force, which I love, uh, and with Silver Bullet, which I referred to earlier. So get this, folks. You, you help finance the revolution, and you get a product that really works. So uh, uh, let me also say as we go forward uh, that I, again, want to thank uh, Alex Jones for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I will be wearing my Trump is my president t-shirt on Inauguration Day. I hope you will as well. Get these now, folks. They will not last forever. They're going to end up in the Smithsonian. Of that, uh, I have no doubt. Uh, when I saw President-elect Trump last week, he told me that anyone whose name you read in the paper is probably put there and generated by that person themselves. All these supposed leaks from the transition, I think, are in fact self-serving leaks from those seeking to promote their candidacies. So take everything you hear with a grain of salt. Until the president-elect announces it, um, it's not a fact. Now, I made no secret about the fact that Reince Priebus, the current Republican national chairman, uh, was not my choice, was not the choice I would have made for chief of staff. But I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to President-elect uh, Trump, uh, and I'm going to keep a close eye on Mr. Priebus to make sure that he is in lockstep with the Trump agenda. I think, frankly, the appointment of Steve Bannon is uh, provides an important balance going forward. Bannon has his eye on the globalists, I assure you. Bannon knows who the bad guys are. So um, it is uh, uh, important to sit back and let the president have his choices. Don't overreact to what you read in the mainstream media because there's at least a 50% chance that that is not true. If you want to keep up with the uh, progress of the Trump transition and the formation of the Trump revolution, you can tune in to the Stone Cold Truth on Saturdays from 1 to 3 Eastern Time uh, on the Genesis Communications Network. And we will bring you the very latest uh, news on the Trump transition. On November 22nd, I will debate Gerald Posner, the author of Case Closed, on the question, Who Killed John F. Kennedy? You're going to want to tune in for that as well. Many thanks, Leanne. Thank you. Thank everyone here at InfoWars been great to be with you. Thank you, Roger Stone, and we'll see you tonight. InfoWars Nightly News, tonight at 7.